Uh, good morning and welcome to the 14th meeting of the committee in 2014. Um, can I ask everyone to switch off uh, mobile phones and other electronic equipment as they affect the broadcasting system? Some committee members may consult tablets during the meeting. This is because we provide meeting papers in digital format. Um, our first item of business today is consideration of an affirmative instrument on the valuation and rating exempted classes Scotland Order 2014 draft. May I welcome our panel this morning, John Swinney MSP, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Employment and Sustainable Growth, and Marianne Cook, the Policy Manager, Local Government Finance Unit of the Scottish Government. Welcome and good morning. Captain, uh, Cabinet Secretary, would you like to make any opening remarks, please? Thank you, Kavir. Uh, the purpose of this instrument is to ensure that a new gas pipeline, the Shetland Islands Regional Gas Export Pipeline, known as the Surge Pipeline, has the same exemption under the non-domestic rating system as all other offshore oil and gas pipelines in Scotland and the rest of the United Kingdom, all of which are exempt from non-domestic rating. The Scottish Government is committed to making Scotland the best place to do business in the UK and recognises that business rates play a part in attracting and retaining businesses in Scotland. These regulations will bring the pipeline into order with other similar offshore pipelines which are exempt from non-domestic rates. The pipeline that this instrument relates to is currently being constructed from the Shetland Islands to link into an existing pipeline in the North Sea known as the Fuka pipeline. As the legislation currently stands, when the pipeline becomes operational, it will fall out with the current exemption. Um, we have undertaken our statutory duty convener to consult on these draft regulations and consulted with the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities, um, with local authorities, the Scottish Assessors, the Oil and Gas Industry, the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors and the Institute of Re Revenue Ratings and Valuation. The consultation received three responses, all of which are content with the draft regulations. Um, I'm happy to take any questions that the committee may have this morning. Kavina. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Are there any questions for the Cabinet Secretary from members? No. In which case, can we move on to item two? Uh, and we now move on to formal consideration of the motion to approve the valuation and rating exempted class, classes Scotland Order 2014 draft, on which we have just taken oral evidence. Um, does any member wish to speak in the debate? No. Um, in that case, Cabinet Secretary, can I ask you to formally move the motion, please? Thank you. I move the motion in my name to approve the valuation and rating exempted classes Scotland Order 2014. Thank you. The question is that motion S4M 09977 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you very much uh, and thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I now suspend for just a couple of minutes for a change of witnesses. Thank you. Um, agenda item two today um, is an oral evidence session on our inquiry into the flexibility and autonomy of local government in Scotland. Uh, we have three panels this morning. Um, I'd like to welcome our first panel, uh, Dr Peter McLaverty of Robert Gordon University and Professor James Mitchell of the University of Edinburgh. Uh, welcome and good morning, gentlemen. Would you like to make any opening remarks? 
Oh, well, in which case we'll move straight on to the questioning. Um, as part of our inquiry, uh, the committee has, uh, or part of the committee, undertook a, a trip to Germany uh, and Denmark and Sweden, a, a whistle-stop trip, it has to be said. Um, one of the things that, uh, of course, we see uh, in our European neighbours and in other places throughout the world is the fact that local government has a constitutional place. Um, can I ask you, gentlemen, uh, do you think that uh, that, that helps uh, local government? If, uh, and would it help here if, if local government had a constitutional place? Um, Professor Mitchell, would you like to start off? Uh, yes, I think it would. I think, however, um, the, there is a key difference between the United Kingdom and other polities in Europe, and that is the absence of a formal, entrenched, written constitution, which would make that more difficult, not impossible, but would make it more difficult, and I think we would have to take that into account. I do think it's important. I think it's important um, in two ways. I think, first, symbolically, it's important. It's always useful to have something uh, formally written down somewhere that guarantees... Um, the rights privileges of institutions of, 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 local, of local government, local democracy. But also substantively, I think it can make a difference. It can protect um, local autonomy. That said, the, 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 the substantive point I've made, there has to be a caveat because the extent to which that protection exists in, real, in reality uh, can vary. And it depends on other aspects of the Constitution, notably the judicialisation of uh, uh, such institutional politics, i.e. the extent to which um, local government in reality can appeal to the courts for its protection. But overall, I think it is advantageous. Uh, um, but um, that alone, I don't think, would be enough to protect local government. Thank you. Dr McLaverty, please. I would basically agree. I think it would be good if there was something that protected the position of local government, their ability to carry out certain functions and gave them a position which it was difficult to change. Um, I think the thing about uh, giving a, a constitutional position for local government would be that um, there would be some restraint on central government just changing how local government is organised, what it can do, and there would have to be some agreement across politics and within the society that change was necessary. So I think it would give local councils a more secure position and probably more freedom to do the things that they need to do. So I would, I would be in favour of it. We, we've also looked at participation levels as we've been um, going around uh, and obviously participation levels are, seem to be much higher um, in most uh, of, uh, of the countries that we have looked at thus far. Um, can I ask you what do you think um, stops the kind of levels of participation that we have in, the, in Germany and Denmark and Sweden from, from happening here? Um, and how can we increase the levels of participation um, that, uh, that, uh, to the levels that they have? Professor Mitchell? Um, I, I think that the evidence in this would suggest, um, there's never any, anything that's definitive about this, such evidence, but I think it strongly suggests that the more powerful the uh, level of government, um, the more likely people are to turn out. In fact, it's really more about people's perception of the importance of local government. There's ample evidence in looking across liberal democracies at turnout and participation in elections at different levels of government. What we tend to find is that there is far higher turnout um, at levels which uh, uh, have a great deal more power, a um, great deal of theoretical work and empirical evidence on, on that. So, for example, um, we... This, these European elections coming up may be an exception for a variety of reasons, but we would expect turnout in European elections to be relatively low, particularly low as compared with elections to a national parliament, because the public do not perceive them as terribly important. And I, I would suggest that turnout in local elections is low partly for that reason. However, I'm um, sorry, I'm always putting in a caveat, mm -hmm. but the however is that, in truth, turnout has been an issue over the course of the 20th century in local government. Indeed, in a report I produced last year, I went back and looked at some of this, and actually going back to the 1920s, people were complaining about local government turnout, election turnout, and local government then was much more powerful than it is today. However, I, I do think the perception of the importance of the institution to which people are, are returning representatives is important. 
Dr McLaverty. I think that's absolutely true. I think all, all, all the evidence supports that. The more people think that the elections matter, that they're going to have an impact on, on the lives in a big way, the more likelihood there is that people will, will vote. Um, I think people are, have got the wrong idea about uh, the importance of local government because it does, it does cover very important services that have a big impact on people's lives, but it's not perceived as important. The other point I think that needs to be borne in mind is that turnout in elections in Britain generally has not been good recently. There's a problem with turnout at all levels, be it local government, Scottish Parliament, Westminster and so on. There is a general problem uh, that isn't unique to Britain but that seems to be quite developed in Britain. And I think what's happening in local government has to be put within that broader broader perspective. There is a, a mistrust of politicians and politics in Britain, which is borne out by survey uh, research, which I think is having a bad impact on people's involvement in politics, including voting in elections. John Wilson, please. Thank you, Convener. Just to go back to the first question the Convener asked, and that's the written constitution. If we were to establish a written constitution for local government, who would draw that up? Who would enact it? Uh, because one of the problems that we have, and which we know from this place, is that we, had, we were established under the Scotland Act 1998. However, the powers are decided by Westminster. By setting up a constitution uh, for local government, who would control the powers over deciding what would actually be in that constitution? Uh, and who would basically ultimately be responsible for amending or changing that constitution? Dr McLaverty, do you want to go first this time, please? Well, that's obviously not an, an easy thing to, uh, to answer. I think you've raised an important issue. Um, I don't suppose there'd be aspects at Westminster that were very keen on the Scottish Parliament and Scottish local government coming up with a constitution for, for Scottish local government. And... It is an issue. Um, we don't have, as Professor Mitchell said earlier, we don't have a written constitution in Britain. There's very little that's set out in detail of the powers and responsibilities of different organisations. And it would be difficult, I think, just to establish a constitution for local government that isn't part of a bigger constitution. And that certainly isn't going to happen until Scotland's future is sorted out. Um, I, I very much agree with Peter on, on, on those points. I mean, it, what would be useful um, would be to, to um, take the issue of writing a written constitution, whether a UK or a Scottish constitution, out of the hands of Parliament, with all due respect to parliamentarians. And I think it should be done um, through an, an elected constitutional convention. Um, that is, the, I understand, the, the position of the Scottish Government. It is an issue which is currently being debated across the UK. The House of Commons um, Political and Constitutional Reform Committee um, looked at this a couple of years ago. I gave evidence to that committee on constitutional conventions. And there are certainly voices on that committee and in Parliament Westminster who believe either in a UK constitutional convention or indeed constitutional conventions, plural. Um, and it is conceivable that that might be a way forward. However, um, it has to be said, while there may be voices in Parliament Westminster who support this, I, I do not detect any voices amongst senior uh, front benchers of either party. However, that politics can, can move on. Um, I do think, um, in terms of drawing up that constitutional convention, or, the con or a, rather a, con a constitution, it's um, always useful to draw on the public at large. There are different ways of doing it. There's been an enormous amount of research, very interesting research in comparative constitutional uh, developments um, over the years. Uh, there's now a wonderful website, Comparative Constitutions, where you can go and look at constitutions through the ages. They're all available. You can actually trace this. I've done this myself and looked at the, the extent to which local government is written into constitutions and has been over time. Um, what we see very clearly, without going into any of the great detail, um, is that local autonomy 
is increasingly included in, in written constitutions, um, as indeed many other um, aspects are written into constitutions, women's rights and so on and so forth, which were not in the past. So I think, I mean, uh, my short answer is that under the current constitutional dispensation, um, Parliament, Westminster, would ultimately have that, that the final say. And the concern there is that if, for example, an Act of Parliament was passed, um, Parliament, Westminster cannot bind, bind as its successor, and so that could relatively easily uh, be, be overturned. Um, I think what we would be looking for would be some form of entrenchment, but entrenchment can come in different forms, not just constitutional legal entrenchment. There can be a, a democratic entrenchment, i.e. that people very strongly support something and would resist uh, attempts to change it. I have to say, looking back in recent history, there's not much evidence of that. One looks back to the, the reforms, the reorganisation of the local government in the mid-90s, um, and there was a great deal of opposition to that in Scotland, but ultimately there was nothing that could be done to prevent that reorganisation. Thank you. Give me, I, would, I would be tempted to go into the debate about whether or not we put the statutory duties of local authorities into a constitutional framework because of the non-statutory duty element. But I'll move on to the issue about that Professor Mitchell mentioned about electoral turnout. Now, one of the arguments that, come, that comes from the continent, particularly Denmark, uh, Sweden and other countries, is the turnout in those countries could be viewed to be higher you know, Denmark was at 82% turnout in national elections, 72% in local government elections. Could be because of the nature of the electoral system and the fact that you get more, more inclined to get coalition government rather than one-party government, uh, and people feel that their vote, no matter who they vote for, may actually have more weight than it does currently at the present moment in the UK, Scottish or local government system uh, because of the, the feel that parties, one party state domination uh, undermines the idea and concept of democracy. Dr McCladberty. Well, I think there is evidence that suggests that PR systems tend to have a higher turnout. Whether that is because of PR systems or because of the countries where they've got them is... is a difficult question to answer entirely. Um, I think where people feel that there is a point in voting, that one party isn't going to just uh, get home without much of a fight, then there's more likelihood of people voting. Um, I, I'm not entirely sure, however, that simply just changing the voting system is going to make all that much difference. I think people have got to feel that it's worthwhile voting for local councils, or that it's worthwhile voting more generally in Britain. And while I think that the voting system can have a role to play in that, it would be wrong to see it as the solution in itself. And uh, we saw what happened when we tried to get AV introduced for elections to the House of Commons. There was a big majority against that in the referendum. And I'm not sure that there's going to be much... Um, encouragement, certainly from Westminster, to, to bring in uh, PR systems for elections to local government. Uh, or I know we have PR for local government here in Scotland, don't we? We have the single transferable vote system, and that doesn't seem to have made a massive difference to turnout. So I think we need to be careful about um, putting too much importance on act actual electoral system. I think it's what people think they can achieve by voting that matters. I would agree uh, with Peter. In fact, if anything, I would maybe push the argument further and suggest that the electoral system has very little to do with turnout. Um, I think when we look at why people turn out to vote, there are a number of explanations, but to take but two. One is, uh, if you like, an instrumental explanation, i.e. one votes for a political party because that political party is expected to produce public goods that you support, as against a civic responsibility explanation, i.e. I turn out to vote because I think it's the right thing to do because I am a citizen and it's part of my duty. What we appear to have seen in the United Kingdom and, and some other polities, though not Denmark, and I'll come back to Denmark in a moment, is a, a decline in the civic responsibility aspect of turning out to vote. Um, people may be turning out for instrumental reasons, um, but the civic element has declined. It has not disappeared, I should stress, and I think therein lies one of the challenges. And it also links into the Danish 
situation. I don't think it's to do with the electoral system in Denmark where you get higher turnout. What you have is far, far greater civic engagement. Mm -hmm. You have far more pressure group activity. Membership of political parties is vastly higher than in the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. uh, participation in politics generally is higher. So there does seem to be a greater, if you like, civic culture in Denmark and other countries um, which is... is is not present in, in the United Kingdom. So I do think we need to address that. One way of addressing that, and I think a crucial way of addressing that, is at local level. There is no doubt that the local community is the building block of democracy, and that if we have thriving local communities, a sense of belonging, then we will be more likely, and I stress be more likely rather than predict that it will happen, but we will be more likely to have a more thriving local democracy and indeed democracy in Scotland. So I, I don't think the electoral system in itself is enough of an explanation, though it is conceivable that there will be those who will fail to vote because they don't think it will make a difference. But that would be true, you know, whether they think it will be a, a coalition or whatever else. They may feel that all the political parties are the same, and I'm sure you've all heard that before. I don't agree with that view, but it is a view that is often heard. Thank you, Cameron Buchanan, please. Thank you. Good morning, panel. Um, just say, in Italy particularly, they changed the voting system to, from first, from first past the post to a combination of first past the post and PR. It made absolutely no difference to the turnout. What they said the problem was, was it was the frequency of elections, that the people didn't find it was relevant. We find also with local, with local government, people don't think it's very relevant, but particularly in Europe, which arguably is the most relevant of all as far as we're concerned, the turnout is remarkably low all over Europe, not just it's, it's due to cynicism. And I just wonder what you thought. There is a sense of, as you say, civic responsibility and public duty in that sort of thing, but it's diminished completely. In Denmark and in, certainly in Finland, I know that those two countries, it's very high, and also in Germany in the regional elections, but it isn't here. Could you maybe comment on that? Yeah, I would agree with that. On the Italian situation, I think it's some very interesting work that's been done by an American political scientist, Robert Putnam. I mean, he started doing work in Italy many, many years ago, and he's since developed his work um, out beyond that. And one of his arguments that, in essence, is informing what I'm seeing today is the importance of what he calls social capital, the sense of civic responsibility, the sense of belonging, the connectedness. Um, he, he, he's written a very interesting book, book some years ago on, on, on decline in civic uh, culture in the United States and he entitled it Bowling Alone. And what he was referring to was the, was the decline of not just political institutions but social institutions that in the 50s, 60s, uh, into the 70s, Americans would join big bowling clubs, of join choirs and such like. And that, in a sense, created that social cohesion. And he argues and provides some evidence, some of which has been challenged, I should stress, um, that there has been a decline in the social capital. And I think that's also true in the United Kingdom. I think we've seen that in a number of respects, the decline of the trade unions, um, the churches, and so on and so forth all of which I think are a part. They may not be political in the kind of party political sense or capital P political sense, but they are, I think, a vital and vibrant part of any act of democracy. And I think that's something that we have to, to consider. And again, I come back to my point. I do think that at root, this is a local issue. If we, You can't really do it from the top down. We've got to try and facilitate this bottom-up approach uh, uh, to encouraging civic responsibility. The other final point I would want to make is we, we've got to be careful we don't overdo it. There is evidence that where you get extremely high turnout, it ne does not necessarily mean that you've got a healthy democracy. You often find very high turnout in those places where there is extreme conflict. Northern Ireland traditionally has had some of the highest turnouts in elections and local elections, particularly during the Troubles. Um, and that was really a function of the, the nature of the Troubles um, and not a healthy aspect of democracy. So I wouldn't want to overstate that point. Like that. So I throw that caveat in as well. Dr. Um, yes, I haven't got much to add, really. I think, I think um, James has said most of it. We do live in a privatised and individualised culture where people are not really encouraged to come together and to, to, to do things collectively. And I think that is part of the problem. People um, have become uh, disconnected. They don't take a public view of issues. They see things very much in an individual or individualised way. And I think that's at the basis of, of, of the problem. How we tackle that is not straightforward. It's not clear what we can do to uh, turn the thing around. But I think... Unless we do get this sort of civic culture, this idea that it's right that people should take an interest in what happens 
in their local communities and in politics generally, this isn't going to be turned, turned down. But it can't be divorced from what's happening in the rest of the society, from what's happening with the economy and so on and things like that. I think it has to be taken as a whole and you can't just divorce this from other developments in, in the wider society. Um, coming back to that sort of thing with public duty, I mean, p people just are not joining, whether it's the Rotary, the Girl Guides, whatever it is, they're just not joining it. Community councils, a lot of them have great difficulty in attracting any membership, and in theory that should be the basis of local democracy. Would you think that we, the, 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 the um, community council should be strengthened in some way to give them more relevance? I mean, I don't know if you get any more votes, and I do agree with the point that you, it, people have got to find these things relevant. When you go to the doorsteps, they don't find their local council relevant at all. They don't know what they do, and they don't even know who the councillors are, many of them. Can I maybe add to that? Because we took evidence um, uh, in Stornoway uh, the week before last, um, and the chief executive of Orkney Islands Council said that we have changed local government many times since 1974, um, the island's largely unaffected in some of those changes. But one of the things that we've not changed from that time um, is the setup of community councils and how they operate. So um, maybe uh, I can add that into the mix and you can respond to that. Dr McCleverty, do you want to go first there? Yeah. Um, community councils should, in theory, be a rich part of the democratic system. They aren't, as you've said. They don't. Um, they often have trouble filling the seats, there are very rarely elections and people don't take them very seriously. Um, I think if you're going to do something with community councils, we then need to think about the whole of the local government system. You can't just change community councils without doing something to the whole local government, uh, the way local government is organised and who has control over, 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 over what services and what activities and so on. One thing that has been suggested is that local councils in Scotland should be smaller, that, that certainly in comparison with councils in other parts of Europe, they are geographically big and they, they encompass a large number of people. So one thing that we might consider doing is making local councils more local, making them smaller, so that, in a sense, we incorporate community councils within um, a rearranged uh, local government system. But, again, I think we need to be careful. Size is not, I don't think, the main issue, although I think something could be achieved if councils were smaller. The main issue is that people feel disengaged. As, as you said earlier, they're not sure what councils do. They don't know who their representatives are. Unless we can tackle that, get people to see the importance of local councils, what they do for them and the community... I don't think tinkering with structures is going to solve it. I think it's quite notable that um, the islands councils have amongst the highest turnout and have consistently had amongst the highest turnouts. And I think there must be a lesson in that. That said, the islands are, are I mean, as you no doubt know, I mean, they're struggling with some of these issues in terms of uh, decentralisation within the islands. Because, you know, if you're in some of these islands, and I'm off to Shetland uh, later this week, and, you know, um, you know, you could be on an island miles away from the chief executive and the local councils, and that can be a problem too. And that's where I think Peter's point about the decentralisation is hugely important. I think we need to look again at the relationship between communities and and indeed local councils and get that that balance right. Um, I say communities rather than community councils because I'm not sure that community councils uh, they have such a variable um, um, experience we've had a, a, of community councils. In some areas, they're very active. Uh, in other areas, they're non-existent. Um, it does, in some cases, appear to, to rest on individuals, if a, a particular small group or... It, indeed, one individual is very active, he or she, and I have to say, at the roots, if you look in our local communities, it is an almost always she that is running the local communities, um, and, and I think that is important and, and a notable feature. We need to somehow empower, I think, um, people at that level. It's not easy, but actually, you know, if we start to give power to local communities, it has to come at the expense of somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Are people comfortable with that? And there are consequences. So we do need to think this through, but I think it's certainly something we need to look at. But I do think Peter's important point about, uh, you know, the size of local authorities, whether we could be more decentralised, is a very, very important important one. Very supplementary. It would appear that community councils in the cities are less active than the ones in rural areas. 
have your comment on that. There is a lot of evidence for that, but also I think another feature is class. There's no doubt whatsoever that in middle class areas they're much more active, more likely to be active. And I think partly because in poorer areas people are basically trying to survive and so you don't get the social capital. We've broken down the social capital in many of our poorer communities and I think that's been a major feature. So it's certainly true to some extent cities, but I think class is not unimportant in this. Please. Thanks, Convener. Um, really, just to take you back, um, Dr McClaverty, about encouraging, could I have your views on, uh, when we're encouraging community participation, can I have your views on the, our education system? Do we do enough within schools and start from a younger age? Well, that's another argument that, that's often made, that um, children don't learn enough about politics and that they don't understand how politics works so that when they get the vote at 18 or whatever they're uninformed about why it's important and, and how the system works and so on. Um, I think there's something to be said for introducing pupils even in primary school to the way in which politics is important within society, not, not to try and indoctrinate them in, in, into certain political beliefs, but just to try and explain why politics matters. Um, I, that might help to make it seem more relevant. I honestly don't know. I know that the Scottish Parliament used to have the um, MSPs in school system. I think um, some evidence, I know that was reasonably successful in encouraging students to become interested in politics. I don't know. I think it, it depends on what's happening in the wider society and whether politics is seen as important and worthwhile. I mean, I think we need to be honest. For whatever reasons, politics has got a bad name in Britain, and so have politicians, and there's no point in trying to deny that. And I don't know whether doing more in schools would necessarily <coughs> tackle that issue, but I think it's something that we should consider. I think it would be good if everybody when they left school at whatever age had a clear idea of how we governed and the role they can play within it. I think that would be good. And I don't think they do at the moment. Even if they take modern studies to uh, the, end, the end of the school life, they're often, from the students I teach, they're often confused about who does what and, and how decisions are made. Confused about it as well. Uh, Professor Mitchell, please. Oh, that's a really interesting, really interesting, quite a challenging question. Now, I think that, that there must be a role for education in some way. I, I, I hesitate, however, to say what that should be because I wouldn't feel terribly qualified. The only point I would make, and I think Peter articulated much better than I could have, the only point I would make is that I think um, it shouldn't simply be about politics because there's much more to civic life than politics and indeed much more to political activity than that. I mean, I, when I teach my students politics, my first lecture is what is politics mm -hmm. and I point out the derivation of that word. It's about the polis, it's about the community. Man is by nature a political animal, as Aristotle said. Essentially what he was saying is that we live in communities, ergo we have politics, mm -hmm. ergo we have to find ways of living together, communicating, making collective decisions. I wouldn't suggest we should go into schools and say what I've just said, but if we could find a way of getting that point across, that when we live in our communities, we've got to find ways of making decisions that impact on one another, and we've got to find ways of, of explaining that actually throughout our lives, from the moment we wake up in the morning, so right through the day, we are affected by politics in the sense that I'm talking about. Um, party politics is only one small part of that, a very important part, of course, but I think that is the challenge. Uh, and I think possibly the problem is that people's perception of politics today is a very narrow conception. And I think we need to do that, um, uh, whether it's as academics in our, our work, you as politicians, and I have to say also, crucially, um, the media, nobody left, well, watching for the media, but I think they've got to, to start uh, behaving in a way that, that, that uh, puts forward a, a, a very different uh, impression of politics, a much broader conception of politics. Okay. Uh, Alec Rowley, please. Good morning. In terms of the devolution that, 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 that came to Scotland, there is a view, if you talk to people in local government, that that devolution didn't follow through, and indeed you have seen a reverse of that under successive governments in Scotland. You had ring fencing for the, the last lot, if you like, and this lot have, have been a bit more 
uh, suspect about the way that they've done it. But there is a view amongst people in local government that we've had a centralisation. I mean, what's your take on that? Very strongly. I would go back before devolution uh, in the paper I wrote for Solace, which I believe you've, you've seen a copy of. I've tried to trace that back over decades. And what we tend to find is that oppositions are in favour of decentralisation and then governments are uh, centralised. And it doesn't matter which political party. Um, a, a party in government may, for a period, decentralise, but ultimately and I, I, it will centralise. I think one of the questions is not to put this in party political terms, and I'm grateful you didn't do that, um, but I think it's to try and understand why do governments at the centre centralise. And I think it's partly a degree of frustration, the sense that things need to be controlled, um, uh, and also pressure on central governments, because it's not just governments, parliaments play a part in this. Um, and, and many of you may even, uh, with all due respect, be guilty of using the term postcode lottery. That language is incompatible with believing in decentralisation, I would suggest. And so I think we've got to get out of the habit of talking about this. But I fundamentally agree with you. I, I, I would point to um, Sir Neil McIntosh's report, the report he, he, he chaired the commission on local democracy, which uh, Donald Dewar set up in 1998. I believe it reported in June of 1999, just a month after the Scottish Parliament had been elected. It put forward a series of proposals, a concordat between local government and, uh, and the Scottish Parliament, and proposed a way of moving forward. Some of that was taken forward, but too much of it wasn't. I would like to see uh, Sir Neil's proposals brought forward and examined. Uh, by chance, I was speaking at an event with Sir Neil on Friday last week, and I, I, I cannot uh, urge you strongly enough to, to call him as a witness and to hear what he has to say, uh, a man with immense experience and expertise uh, and a fascinating insight into these matters. Dr McLaverty. I just agree with that completely. I think if you look at the history of what's happened across Britain, Governments have been elected centrally who were supposedly in favour of local government, in favour of local councils having more power, and then they've done the, the exact reverse when they've got into government. It's a real problem. Central government wants to control local government. It's not a party political thing. It crosses all parties that have been in government. And I think unless we can tackle that, local councils will not get back the power that, that they need. I, I, I agree they should. Local councils should have more power, they should have more freedom. But how you actually stop successive central governments wanting to take more power and to control local government, I don't know what the answer is. Dr Rowley. There was a bit of experimentation happened um, down south with the last Labour government around elected mayors. Is there any evidence coming through for that in terms of its impact or not? I think the mayors have had a massive impact in increasing turnout at elections or regenerating their areas. It varies. Some mayors will have been more successful than others, but they're seen, I think, very much as an individual that has power. They're not seen as uh, a position that's decentralised power and or that's tried to in increase public participation very much. And it's interesting that... In England, they had a series of votes on whether or not areas wanted to establish mayors a few years ago, and they all voted, well, they nearly all voted against. So I'm not sure that mayors is the way for, elected mayors is the way forward. In fact, I don't think it is. I, I'm not sure I would support mayors, but I do like the idea of looking at such matters. And, and I think in the case of the mayors, the experience uh, in England has been variable again. Mm. Uh, but then it should be variable. It should reflect local diversity. And, and of course, well, some of us may conclude that uh, it's been successful in one place and unsuccessful in another. We've got to ask ourselves, what criteria are we mm. using in that respect? Mm. What I do think we need to do is to start looking at that and other initiatives and seeing whether we can move forward, um, perhaps with some experimentation. However, my fundamental point about what we ought to be doing is that any reorganisation of local government has to come from below. What I would be strongly against would be another royal commission from on high, great minds sitting around and drawing up a map of Scotland and deciding that way. I think what we need to encourage, if you like, to, to, to go back to something I said earlier, are almost local uh, constitutional conventions. What is needed in a particular area? And I would cite as, a, as an extremely good example of the kind of local initiative, uh, the Our Islands, Our Futures, which I know you've been looking at initiative and which I think is, is a phenomenally interesting
interesting, exciting development. Um, I was, I was, I spoke at their launch conference up in Kirkwall at the end of September. As I think I said earlier, I'm off to Shetland later in the week. I think there is something really exciting going on there. That which is appropriate to the islands will not necessarily be appropriate to Aberdeen, to Edinburgh, East Lothian, or wherever, or Fife. Um, but that, I think, is a kind of model looking at from below. It will result, of course, in a rather messy landscape, but Scotland is messy. I think the problem we have is a mindset which expects symmetry across Scotland. People are not symmetrical. People, we do not live in that kind of way. I think we need to reflect in our governance structures the reality that is messy Scotland. That is what we see across many of the Scandinavian countries that Peter was talking about earlier. We had the um, Chief Executive of the Fife Council in giving evidence a couple of weeks ago. Um, and I should say I campaigned in the 90s for Fife to remain as one local, local government unit. Um, but he was given the example where Fife has seven area committees. Um, bringing in community planning, he gave the example where they're now developing local community plans and they're doing so through their area committees, engaging communities. But crucially, they've also got budgets going to that level. And the evidence that I've seen in Fife over the last couple of years is actually by getting budgets to that level, you actually engage better. So, so I mean, but that community planning model, is, do you believe that there is a role for that as we go forward? Absolutely, absolutely. And we're seeing similar developments elsewhere. In this city, there's some very exciting developments taking place in terms of what is effectively moving towards a kind of total place uh, approach. And that place will not be necessarily the local authority. It may be, be beyond that. I think that's very important. And of course, you, you also touch on something that's uh, extremely important, and that's the relationship between different statutory and non-statutory bodies, local government health boards and the voluntary sector, our communities. We've got to somehow work that relationship out. In a way, Fife has an advantage, partly perhaps because of the success of your campaign in the 90s, in that it is conceived of as a, con a coherent unit for a number of purposes. And so it, 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 it does seem to work. Um, and there is also, I suppose, something that we haven't mentioned, the notion of identity. People do identify. People feel that they are Fifers. Um, and, and that can be quite important. It can be overstated. However, it isn't unimportant, especially in generating that sense of belonging, that engagement, um, which which can arise. I do think that's hugely important in the island communities. I just agree. I've really not got much to add. I think, I think it's a good idea and I think it should be pursued where, where possible. <coughs> Thank you, convener. Good morning, gentlemen. Um, there's been a lot said this morning that uh, obviously I've only got a couple of minutes for questions, but I could uh, probably ask a, a lot more. Um, <laughs> but, uh, indeed. Um, but certainly there was a couple of things that, that have been said. Um, uh, Professor Mitchell, you, you mentioned the issue of the, the postcode lottery a few moments ago, and obviously that's uh, in the report uh, to say that you provided to the committee on page 46. Uh, and um, one of the previous pieces of work that this committee undertook was on the benchmarking. Um, now, going forward, if there is um, a, a change in, uh, in local authorities and the change in the number of local authorities, uh, for example, say that there were, that there were many more smaller local authorities, um, and you've got the issue of um, um, how, how easy would it be for, these, uh, for many more smaller authorities to benchmark what they deliver uh, with others so that, uh, that the people uh, in their particular local authority area uh, can actually get a better service uh, that's actually been delivered. Go ahead, um, th th again, is another huge question that's uh, really important, um, which I'll try to answer, and I'll probably make a mess of my answer, so I apologise, and, and, and I'd want to come back possibly to, to speak to you about that. I mean, I think one of the key things about this is to determine what should be decided at which level. Um, one wouldn't expect to decentralise everything to a local level. The, there are areas where we have to have joint responsibility. And again, to, to the key, key point I would make in this respect is that, again, we need to reflect the needs of local areas. What I find very interesting is, for example, the developments in, in, in Clickman and in Stirling, where they now share an education authority. Essentially, they are one for that purpose. They, they're working together. But they didn't have to get rid of the two local authorities, so you protect the existence of one of Scotland's smallest local authorities, Clickman. Um, and I think that's a really <laughs> interesting development and that's the kind of thing I think we need to see more of in Scotland Without, we don't want to have a, a massive reorganisation I'm very much opposed to that because we spend far too much time on the reorganisation
competition and people are more worried about what job they're going to get and such like, and, and the eyes off the ball. The ball is very clear. It is providing decent services um, as a civically responsible community. We need to create that kind of situation. But I think there are different ways of doing it. But I would, I mean, I, I, I could go into this at greater length and I'm more than happy to come back and speak to you, but I do think we've got to be careful that we don't decentralise things that cannot be run at the most local level. But I think one of the things that we've the situation we find ourselves in today is that I think there's an awful lot of things that have been done at the wrong level, essentially, um, and there are relationships that aren't quite right. One sees this both, if you look at the international uh, examples, but also historically. We have found ourselves with a health boards with responsibility for certain things, which in the past were under local government. I think we're beginning to tackle that. We're beginning to tackle that, but we've got a long way to go. And I, I, that's but one of many examples one can look at. So I, I, I think it's... This is where I think you know we need to reflect the needs of the local communities uh, and, and put trust in them. Things will go wrong. I think that's one of the other things. I mean, one of our biggest problems in politics, modern politics, is a, 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 a utopian expectation that nothing will go wrong. And when something goes wrong, we call for heads and we can say everything's terrible and our politicians are corrupt and hopeless and such like. When we actually put into perspective the range, the vast range of responsibilities, and what happens on a daily basis, the delivery of services across Scotland by those many people, the teachers and nurses across the world, it is phenomenally successful. Dr. McCleverty, you talked uh, about um, sometimes the, the difficulties is if something fails. Do you think in terms of some of the radical thought about joining up services between different public bodies, whether that be councils or others, that sometimes we don't push ahead with that because um, we're scared that the audit system will have something to say about it at the end if it doesn't work out exactly as, as planned? I have to say, I think, I mean, I think some of, uh, I mean, I would have to jump to the Defence of Audit Scotland. I think its reports are fantastically good and useful. And I think some, for example, to look at the reports on CPPs, indeed. I'm talking about other regulatory bodies uh, who also have uh, a yeah, locus indeed. in this. Indeed, I was going to make the distinction between bodies such as Audit Scotland who are performing a really important one. And actually, it's not the regulatory bodies that worry me. Um, I, I, now I'm going to tread dangerously. I'm going to see one of the problems is parliamentarians often. Um, who will then stand up and make a, a speech in Parliament and create a fuss about something. Um, and, and it's as if you know, something could be done about it or else the responsibility of a minister. And we've seen this across uh, governments, regardless of which party is in power, here and at Westminster. And I don't think that's at all healthy. It encourages centralisation. It encourages a, a control freakery, which is not healthy. Um, and sometimes, I, I, I mean, I, I, I won't name names, um, but I, I, I sometimes shake my head in despair when I hear some members of the Scottish Parliament attacking ministers, and I've done that since 1999, I should stress, because I think, you know, there, we've got to be much more constructive in our criticism. Um, and, and really one of the things I think is fundamentally wrong is mindset. Driven ...rather than just necessarily parliamentarian driven. If I was speaking to the media, I would blame the media, but I think... Uh, <laughs> I'm speaking, I'm I, I tend to prefer to, to, to say it straight to the people I'm addressing, and, and, and I don't believe in giving people an easy Time. I think you've got a responsibility. I'm happy if, uh, to go and address the media and tell them about their responsibilities. And indeed, I, I go to my, my colleagues in the universities and tell them about their responsibilities, as I expect people to do to me. <laughs> well, I think local councils should be should feel more willing to take risks, do things that <coughs> aren't generally done. And I think we have got to get away from a, a blame culture. That, I think, is part of the problem why people don't like politics because this is continuous, oh, you've got it wrong, you shouldn't have done that. If we'd done it, we'd have done it so much better. And I think unless we can get a more grown-up attitude to politics, we're going to struggle to engage people and to get them to think that politics is important and worthwhile. On the question of decentralisation or not decentralising things that shouldn't be decentralised, in some continental countries where they do have small local government, they do do things together. A number of local councils work together to provide services or to um, run facilities. And there are issues around that, about accountability of people who are elected. No, no point in trying to deny that. But I think if there's a willingness to be flexible and to recognise that, that things should be done at different levels, then I think we can start making some, some progress and, and start giving local local democracy, 
some meaning again. Um, you've said so much there, uh, and uh, I genuinely appreciate uh, Professor Mitchell's comments uh, and the honesty in which he said them as well. Um, but uh, there was something that was said earlier on as well, uh, sent by Professor Mitchell, and that was uh, regarding the islands uh, and uh, also the, the discussion that's taking place at the moment. Uh, now, uh, you mentioned that the issue of uh, that's coming from uh, from the bottom up. Now, obviously, when we were there, and we were speaking to, uh, I mean, it's on uh, on record as well, but also kind of speaking to uh, folk from the uh, from the community. Uh, many of them felt as if uh, that they weren't actually involved in the discussions. It was something that was being done to them, uh, and they, they weren't involved in consultations, and and, uh, and so they felt really quite disenfranchised. Uh, from that debate and that discussion. Uh, so that, that, that many of the folks in Western Isles thought that power was centralised and stored away. Um, but Professor Mitchell? Yeah, I, I actually made that point in terms of the islands, that people in the outer islands might not feel that the, the chief executive and the councillors uh, you know, making the decisions in any of the three uh, island authorities are actually representing. That is a challenge for the, the island authorities, and I think they are well aware of it. And uh, um, It certainly was an issue that... that, that uh, was debated uh, at, at the launch conference back in September last year. I think that's a valid point, and I think it's something that local authorities have to take into account. Um, I mean, the notion that just because you've been elected, whether it's an MSP or a councillor, means that you are the only legitimate voice in that community is wrong. And I think you've got to, you've got to, to, to and it's, it's in the interest of the elected representatives to listen and get out there and to find means of encouraging that. And that's where coming back to, I think, the kind of model that we need to see is it needs to be a model from the bottom up that does encourage local participation. But again, we have to be very careful, and, and, and I suspect everyone in this room, particularly those who have been councillors, will be aware that in many local communities there will be loud voices that are not necessarily, or aren't elected and aren't necessarily representative of the community. And that is a challenge. Um, and what do we do about that? Now, one possible response, um, uh, which may be inadequate, but I suspect is as good as it gets. Uh, it would be that any any proposed reforms should be put to the electorate um, in a referendum to give it an endorsement. We give it that democratic legitimacy and underpinning that we talked about at the beginning when we talked about um, entrenchment. But I, I take that point, and I think it's very important, and it's in, it's very important that the local authorities do that. If you you know the the headquarters of a local authority can be very distant to many people. I would I'll basically agree with that. I mean, I think we should also look at some of the. Um, well, they're not particularly new these days, but some of the mechanisms that have come out of the debates on deliberative democracy, such as the use of citizens' juries and um, perhaps consensus conferences and things like that. And I think what we also need to ensure is that where local councils engage with the local population through things like citizens' panels, there is a genuine way for the people who are involved to see how it's affecting outcomes that they know that what they are putting forward is being considered, even if it's not being adopted, and they, they, and they know why it's not being adopted. I think all too often, and it's, I understand entirely why it happens, there's a tendency not to take seriously what people say when they're engaged. And unless we do that and show the mechanisms whereby they have an, Im an impact, then we're going to struggle. It's okay. It's a brief one. It's, uh, I know we have a session, a session later uh, from uh, representatives from the, the third sector, but uh, what role um, do you think the third sector can actually play in, uh, in improved uh, service delivery? Well, they're already playing an enormously important mm. role. I think it's uh, not always appreciated the role that the third sector play. Without the third sector, we would we'd not be delivering services as we do. Mm. I think there, uh, there is an interesting debate on the relationship between the statute bodies and the third sector, and that's, that's uh, an ongoing debate. There are issues um, which I'm sure uh, you will hear from SCVO and rightly hear around um, uh, you know, the, the, which the funding of, of local services through the third sector. One thing that the third sector is very good at, I think, is innovation. They're very good at innovating. They, do, they are not bound by the same um, statutory obligations. In some cases, they're not all. Um, and I think one of the problems I, I, I detect is a, a misunderstanding in some cases um, in, in terms of how the third sector views the statutory bodies and vice versa. I think we need to create um, uh, conditions for uh, in which there is greater dialogue 
as we go forward into the future, and something that hasn't been mentioned that is hugely important, we're moving into extremely difficult financial times. A cold, a long, hard, cold winter, I think it was, as the former Auditor General described it. Uh, that will require us to make use of money much more sensibly. That will necessitate a closer relationship between the third sector and statutory bodies. And I think we need to give very serious attention to that. We could not provide the services for, that we currently do without the third sector. Well, I, th I think that's, that's just the case, isn't it? Isn't it? I, I don't think there can be any question about that. They do play an important part in the provision of services and an increasingly important part. I would just raise one caveat, though. If we're talking about trying to increase democracy and public participation in what happens locally, then we need to think about how social enterprises can fit into that. Because a social enterprise, as and of itself, by definition, is not necessarily democratic or an organisation that will promote public participation. So we need to think about what role they can play in an agenda that's based around strengthening local democracy and engaging with the people more effectively. And, and that will take some thinking. C can I add one other point that Peter made me think about that I hadn't thought about until, until, until I heard Peter again. again one of the, the interesting things about the third sector is that over the years as their role has expanded and it is massive now, is that they've taken on to a far greater extent than in past decades a role in service delivery. Yeah. I have a slight concern that that may squeeze out the advocacy role that the third yeah. sector has traditionally played, which is separate from, yeah. I mean, when you are dependent on such bodies for money and such like, it is likely to limit your uh, ability to criticise, and we need to have that criticism, that constructive criticism. Having said that, um, that's the theory. The practice would appear to be quite different, that third sector are more than capable of being critical, but I do think we need to be aware that that can arise in certain circumstances. Thank you very much, convener, and uh, I think this has been a very interesting discussion so far. I wanted to pick up on the issue around communities and how, how communities are engaged, and obviously we focused quite heavily on community councils during the course of the discussions. Now, um, I was interested by the point that Professor Mitchell made around the, the demographics of a community can influence how active or otherwise that community is. And I mean, certainly from within my constituency, I see communities which you would class as being uh, deprived communities, um, where there is a huge amount of community spirit. Um, and probably in these kind of places, people are more likely to know their neighbours uh, and know one another than you would find in more affluent areas. Yet they don't necessarily organise and mobilise to the same extent as perhaps more affluent communities do. And that may be down to professional uh, occupation, etc. But there are still means through which these communities do uh, organise and engage. And do you think that the balance is struck right at the moment where there seems to be a very heavy focus on the community councils as being the forum through which community engagement is viewed and obviously they have a statutory function in that regard? And do you think that we need to look very carefully at how communities are engaged by authorities and whether we've got that balance right? I think we do need to look at uh, new ways of doing it. Community councils, they operate well in some areas, but they, they play no part at all, really, in other areas. And they're not, they're not the answer. There may be one part of an answer, but we need to be much more willing to um, engage with people as service users where they live locally, especially where issues relate to particular lo localities, we need to be more flexible about the type of um, ways in which we try and engage with, 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 with people, try and encourage a more deliberative approach to the participation of, of, of people. And I think we've got to get away from what has been the norm in local government, I think across Britain, that it's a one-size-fits-all situation. You have the same mechanisms for all issues and in all areas. And we need to get away from that. And we do need to be, local councils need to be more willing to be innovative in the way in which they engage with different communities who have different needs and different ways of expressing the needs. So I think, I think we need a number of different mechanisms. There are a number that are out there at the moment. Um, a lot of work's been, been done on, on trying to 
engage people, and I think local councils need to be more willing to do this. The only problem with that is that if you have all these different methods of, of engagement, how do you bring it all together? And there is a danger that you know you lose an overall vision of what should be done. But within that constraint, I think there needs to be more flexibility and more willingness to use different methods. Professor Mitchell. Yeah, I very much agree with Peter on that. I think the plurality of approaches is hugely important. That which is appropriate in one area may not be in another. I mean, I think on the ground, I suspect that community councils are, are not even noticed but in many areas of Scotland. Some areas are very active and very much noticed, but in many areas, what they appear to be doing is the same kind of work that others who are not doing it under the banner of the community council but are very, very active. Um, I mean, my point about the demographics, I think, is is that, again, and, uh, this is a tendency rather than a rule, because clearly there is a great diversity, um, is that you do see um, in certain middle-class areas, frankly, where, the, where people decide they want to have a club for X, Y, or Z, then it, the, the, the local people will have the wherewithal, uh, the resources um, to set one up. And so, you know, I live in an area which, frankly, is reasonably well off and uh, it is rich in social capital. There are enormous numbers of groups and activities that I, my family, can participate in. That also happens in many poor areas, but not to the same extent. And I, and, and I don't, that is not a criticism of people living in poor areas because I think there's a very good reason why that may be the case. And I do think this is where um, uh, statutory bodies, local government, parliament has to step in and to try and even out that distribution uh, and, and play a part in ensuring that those areas which um, m you know, are, are at a disadvantage um, are, are giving a, a, a help there. So I think the kind of plurality is important. Um, and as I say, I think if we can encourage that, we will also see a greater engagement. I think you'll see an interesting relationship between the kind of demographics of an area and also its turnout and such like and, and participation generally. One of the, the points that was being made earlier as well was around the size of local government and um, whether the, the, the right size of local authorities has been achieved uh, when looking at comparison with, with other European nations. And the point was made, obviously, in terms of the island councils about the remoteness, perhaps, of the headquarters. You could make the same point, obviously, about Highland Council or Aberdeenshire Council, which cover vast geographical areas. So while I... I would take on board the point that size is not important. Do you think that it's more about the localism element than the size element necessarily? And if people feel that they are part of something more local, for example, somebody in Fraserburgh would not necessarily feel an affinity with somebody in Lawrence Kirk when it comes to the delivery of services, um, that that localism element might then drive more participation um, from, from people in the communities. It, it could do. Um... I mean, I think there's nothing wrong with having local councils of different sizes. I think the idea that all local councils should be the same size and necessarily carry out the same functions isn't, isn't particularly sensible. Um, and you will need a different structure for a poorly populated rural area than you will for a built-up urban area. I mean, think, thinking that you can govern them in the same way doesn't seem to me to make a lot of sense. Um, how you can do that in uh, a way that keeps the system coherent is, is another matter. But um, certainly they have uh, much smaller local councils in, in other countries. But I think we've also got to be careful about not just equating size with people feeling, feeling committed to the local authority. Um, I think that can happen, but it's not inevitable. And um, I think it's a difficult issue to get to get right the size of, of, of local authorities and their and their boundaries. And um, I don't think there's any simple answers. I think there's a real tension here, and I don't think we should run away from the fact that there is a tension, uh, if you like, between a functional uh, way of organising local government and uh, a, a more decentralist, mm. localist uh, um, way of approaching it. It's worth going back and looking at the Wheatley Commission and its report in the 1960s. It was highly influenced by a functional approach, and what they did um, is to look at what would be the most appropriate size of a local authority 
for different functions. So what would it be for education, for health, and so on and so forth, for housing, for local planning issues. And in the report, it's a very interesting uh, chapter in which they, they discuss this and they conclude that uh, you know, there's a certain size for different functions. Um, and, and that makes a degree of sense. However, <laughs> there, it doesn't really lead to a particular conclusion because the, 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 each function has a different um, uh, appropriate size. Mm. Also, the danger is you lose sight of the other important element, and that's the localist uh, dimension to it. So you've got to get a balance. You've got to get a balance somehow in this. My suggestion is that the best way of doing this is to take the localist as a starting point, as a basic building block, and then build from there. And so where appropriate, you can join together functions. I, I made reference earlier to the Stirling Click Manning situation. Mr Rowley made reference to the Fife situation. One could conceive of Fife as being essentially uh, a, a local authority, but consisting of different communities, each with their own now, to some extent, local, local budgets. That is an interesting way of looking at things. I think we tend to look at the local government from a top-down perspective. If we could start to change our mindsets, and actually, I've come to the conclusion it's the biggest problem is mindset rather than anything else, mm -hmm. and to conceive of things from below upwards. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that we should have um, X number of thousands of local authorities each doing everything, but it may mean we have to have a larger number of local units interacting with others. I can certainly see the case in Scotland, for example, of some mergers of local authorities. I've heard the case, I'm not saying I sign up to it, I must be very clear about this, but I've heard a very powerful case made that the three Ayrshire authorities should be one. I've heard that very powerfully articulated. Now, I could see that case. I could certainly see it particularly if there was also a degree of decentralisation from that which we have as well. I don't think we should see it as necessarily the case that we have to either centralise or decentralise. We might want to do both. Uh, fi finally, convener. Yeah, absolutely. Finally, um, we've had a lot of theoretical discussion around more power for local authorities, um, and, and that's come up again today. Do you have any ideas yourselves on which powers local authorities do not currently possess, which it might be beneficial if they were given control over in the future? Um, I think local authorities uh, should have meaningful, and I stress that word, power of, local, uh, of general competence, and I think that follows from having real local financial autonomy. Over decades now, we've seen local government losing its financial autonomy. That, I mean, at the moment, um, uh, you know, in terms of the particles go debate, there's all this argument about the council tax freeze. Frankly, that is such a small debate in terms of what is required. We need to move well beyond that kind of party politics. And I think we really need to go back. And again, let me conclude by, by uh, citing Sir Neil McIntosh. I would call him before you to look again at what he recommended in June 1999. We really do need to look at finance again that is the only way we'll have real meaningful autonomy uh, all parties have been guilty of this um, and it, that makes it easier for, for the people like us to be critical of this um, because it's not a party political point and I do think we need and I really urge this committee to unite in, 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 a, in a very clear voice on that as many others are currently doing but um, we need to be much more open-minded about how, how local authorities are funded. We've got to avoid the silly kind of uh, responses that if, if local authorities are to be given, say, a range of different taxpayers, that means it will necessarily mean to more tax being paid. That will be the decision made by local people. Well, I would just completely agree with that. Um, in Europe, it's not uncommon for local councils to get 40, 50 percent of their revenue from their own uh, means, whereas here in Scotland it's less than 20%. We do need to tackle that because it does limit um, the role of local councils and it limits how they're seen within the local community as well. So I think we do need to tackle that and we also do need to look at giving councils more freedom to do things. A right of general competence, I think, would be a really good thing for local councils. And I think that provided local councils are meeting statutory responsibilities and they're meeting the needs of the most vulnerable in the society, which they've got to do, and I've, done, I've no question about that, but if they're doing that, then they should have freedom to spend money in the way that local people want them to, and I think that's the way that we should go. Found in Europe, um, round about uh, financial powers, um, there is much more op options for local authorities to come together and inform companies in some regards with the profits going back uh, into public services. 
do you think that that is something that we should be uh, allowing here? Uh, a good example, I think, is um, in southern Sweden, where waste collection is dealt with by uh, a number of public bodies forming a company together, uh, all the profit going back into the, to the municipalities. I, think look at, I don't want to preempt. I'm doing some work on some of these things at the moment. <laughs> what I may conclude, but I do think we need to be very open-minded about that. And I remind you that in the past, local government provided many services, including gas works and mm. so on and so forth, mm. hospitals. Now, I'm not suggesting we should remove hospitals to, from, from health to, and give it to local government, but we've got to be minded of the fact that these things were often done. And some of the greatest innovations in public services occurred at the local level. There's a wonderful piece written by David Donison, um, a grant another grand figure uh, in terms of public service delivery. Um, I think a few months ago he wrote about um, the changes he's witnessed over his, his, his long life. I think he's 88 now. Uh, and, and David made the observation that the, the, if you really want to identify some of the key, really challenging and really exciting innovations in terms of public services, you generally have to look at local. It's, they generally come from local. And over the years, in terms of centralisations that you've talked about, for example, the, the, the power which has just been restored recently um, for local authorities to be um, given the right to uh, generate electricity, for example. Um, these kind of things, um, in terms of the renewables revolution, could open up lots and lots of new uh, revenue streams, particularly for the, the island authorities. Um, do you think that these things um, should be looked at and uh, the level of flexibility um, should be in place so that uh, councils can really mine uh, uh, those, those resources. And, and the islands obviously are making the case for this, but it's also happening elsewhere. And Fife was mentioned earlier, there's some really interesting developments there. I was speaking to people in Fife recently on some of the stuff that's going on there. They're, they're looking at some of these things. So absolutely, let's look at these issues and, and, and opportunities, these ideas. Let's, let's be bolder, yes. less risk averse. Yes, I would absolutely agree with that. I think it's something that should be considered and where it can work, it should be done, I think. I th and the last point, I absolutely agree with that as well. We do need to be bolder about local government, what it can do and what it should do. Um, people used to talk about um, um, gas and water socialism years ago where local councils ran those services. And um, I think, you know, we need to make the most of local councils, but we also need to recognise that if you do give local councils more freedom, there are going to be differences. And we've got to be prepared to live with that. And I think some people wouldn't be happy because the differences could be quite big. Thank you for that. In terms of differences, um, Professor Mitchell would be missing a trick uh, n not to get you to, to comment on Christie. Um, and obviously a, a number of recommendations uh, from the Christie Commission. Where do you think uh, we're at in terms of dealing with some of these things? Uh, and... Uh, where, where should we be looking at, at going in terms of uh, allowing uh, yeah, that to progress? I remember appearing before this committee a few months after the report was published, and uh, I think I said some fairly challenging things in the committee back then too. Um, I, I think we've made great progress. I think we've still got an awful long way to go. I think we're moving into extremely difficult times. Many of the Christian recommendations, you look at the four pillars, um, in terms of the integration of services, um, bringing local communities and individual individuals, the personalisation agenda, I think in terms of prevention um, and creating greater efficiency, the four pillars, I think all of these remain hugely important. What I, I guess the, I take a great deal of comfort from the fact that uh, there appears to be uh, near unanimity around the principles, um, at least that's what people tell me, uh, that they all agree with it, but I don't see quite the... the the extent of implementation that I would like. And I, maybe I'm impatient, but I think we could and should be doing so much more. But I, I accept that we're going to be moving into very difficult times. I think for, particularly on, for example, the prevention agenda, which will require shifting resources. It's, it, it, we, you know, it's very difficult in a time when we've got financial cutbacks, as we are now facing. So I'm impatient. I'm very impatient. And, and as other members of the Commission are, I'm sure we're all patient, but we're watching it very closely. And, and, and I think it, it is one of, of many similar reports that we published, and I, I very much go back again to Neil McIntosh, um, that informed that there was nothing, there was no rocket science in Christie. It was pulling the expertise of people across Scotland, best practice. Um, somehow we've got to scale that up. We've got to move that forward.
Thank you very much for your time today, gentlemen. Uh, that's been enlightening. Uh, can I suspend for a couple of minutes for a change of witnesses, please? Um, we now move on to the second panel. Uh, I'd like to welcome Councillor Graham Garvey, President of the Scottish Provost Association and Convener of the Scottish Borders Council, and Councillor Tom Kerr, Secretary of the Scottish Provost Association uh, and Provost of West Lothian Council. Uh, welcome, gentlemen. Good morning. Would you like to make any opening remarks? Well, thank you very much, Jim. First of all, thank you very much for inviting us. Uh, as I said to you just briefly there, uh, you were very quick off your mark just after we reformed the... Uh, uh, relaunched, as I should say, uh, as an association to invite us. So we hadn't had time to give you any written submission, but I do have some remarks that might be of interest to you. Firstly, without saying a word about ourselves, you see, we're not quite in the first flush of youth, but we're still uh, rookie as far as the association goes. Uh, I um, have been a councillor since 2003. Before that, uh, some years before that, I was chief executive of a Scottish local authority, probably an unusual situation that, for that to happen in life. And in between, I worked for the Foreign and Commonwealth Office at, at length in the Balkans in helping to reconstruct their, their countries. That's a very brief resume of me. My colleague might want to say something. Tom? Yes, I th thank you for inviting us along. Um, I've been a councillor since 1992, and I've been provost of West Lothian for the last seven years. Prior to that, I worked in the private sector in the marine industry and uh, operated my own marine consultancy for about X number of years. That will not give my age away. I'll let Graham start, and then I'll continue. Um, yes, the Office of Provost was established in Scotland by King David I in 1126, and it's been an ancient office, and it's kind of um, been at the centre of Scotland's life until 1975, when the Wheatley Report was implemented and the baby was thrown up with the bathwater in my book. We lost a lot in that time. There was no designations uh, other than the Lord Provost of the cities. And we lost Bailey's magistrates. The whole ceremonial thing was not addressed properly at that time. So a large part of what we're about is trying to revive that side of it and working in parallel with COSLA, who do the party political work. And we work very closely with colleagues in COSLA. Um, our objectives are to promote the image and dignity of Scottish local government, to advance the well-being of Scottish local democracy and the people of Scotland, and to provide a forum for civic heads to pool their experiences. Quite often, a civic head is thrust into that quite different role in life without any kind of support or training. So that's very helpful, and also to arrange training, which we're now currently doing with the Improvement Service through Colin Mayer, putting in place uh, arrangements for that in the coming months, and to collaborate with COSLA closely as to their work uh, in the political sphere. 
Um, in previous times, as you will know, and stop me if you all know what I'm about to say, the, the provost was both a civic head and the political head. In more recent times, councils have become much more political, and therefore it seemed a natural development. It's only in the last 10 or 15 years this has happened, um, that there should be two distinctive roles. And now we, uh, nearly all of Scotland's 32 councils have a civic head and a political leader of the council's administration. And just to emphasise the ongoing working relationship between the two is, in my view, absolutely crucial to the harmonious working of the administration of the council. In between five years' elections, or soon to revert to four years, most of the work is non-political. It's just delivering the services. So it's really important that any administration, that, that the, the people come together in that admin with, with the province of you know, working closely with the administration. So that, to me, is an interesting development. Around about election times, things change a bit. Um, so in this field of civic leadership, distinguishing that role from the political leadership, the value of a non-political association of provosts as a defender of the institution of local government and the idea of local democracy cannot, we believe, be understated. So that's really um, an initial um, statement. I could go on about functions that bother us, about what's happened in recent years, as mentioned by the professor, but we've lost a lot of local government, and there's real concern amongst our membership, that not only has local democracy been adversely affected by a power grab by all governments to the centre, and it's happened in England and Wales too, but also the, the advent of the Parliament here in 1999 has led, I think, understandably, it's a new thing, understandably, to a huge public focus and emphasis on national politics in Scotland and away from local government. It's interesting to note, Chairman, that there are now no national newspapers at all in Scotland with a local government correspondent. And the visibility of local government, I think I'm right in saying that, has been greatly diminished. And it's been argued this general lack of visibility, the power grab to the centre, coupled with the party political orientation of stories when they do appear in the press, is one of the main causes of low voter turnout uh, at local government. Now, I may be answering to questions, you've probably gone over this before, but you were asking about, I think it was Mr. McDonald was asking about what, what functions should go back to local government. I, I don't want to you to okay. preempt the questions that you're All likely right. to get, Provost Garvey. Okay. Um, I'm Kabeer, so by the way, not Provost. There's, there's a variety of us. Most of us are called Provost. Some of us are still called Kabeer's. Historical reason for that in the borders. So oh. We have honorary Provost. Uh, um, I'll so. maybe stick to the councillor title then. Um, I don't mind. Uh, Tell me what you like. First of all, you, you did hear um, Professor Mitchell earlier uh, uh, answering a question by Mr Rowley about uh, some of the, the places down south that have moved to uh, elected mayors who have uh, the political power. What do you feel of the idea of having elected provosts, if you like, here um, in Scotland? I think that's irrelevant. It doesn't matter. What matters to me is proper powers being discharged locally by able people. I don't think we need to look at the whole... And in fact, Neil McIntosh, who was a, was a colleague of mine, in his report referred to, actually dismissed the idea in 1999 for the valid reasons in his report. I think it's a gimmick. Some countries do it. London have a very popular mayor. In America, in America, they do this. I don't think Scotland needs this. What we need are able councillors with the proper services run locally, accountable to local people. So my, that's my immediate response. It's an irrelevance. Yes, um, I tend to agree with Graham. I, I don't think the elected mayor system has really much to offer, I think, as far as we are concerned in Scotland. I think decentralising is very important. I think everyone this morning, including your two previous speakers, went on at great length about the centralisation that had taken place. And um, remember that at the moment I am speaking, and so is Graham. we're speaking uh, as officers of the Provost Association, yeah. but we could drift into personal opinions as well. And I hope you will appreciate that, and I'll try and distinguish between. We are not necessarily speaking for the other 32 conveners or provosts in, in Scotland. Uh, on the elected mayor system, I, I agree with Graham. I think it's more important that decentralising down to the existing authorities, uh, which has, in a great number of cases has been taken away, and then look seriously, seriously and constructively, uh, and it will vary, as has been said earlier, throughout Scotland, on what that smaller uh, democratic system, if you want to call it that, or that smaller authority or that smaller grouping uh, does and what services they perform. And certainly I have got personal views on that, um, I do think that over the years, the, having had a lot of experience of community councils, they have been a complete failure, in my opinion. 
and I think it was a serious mistake on Wheatley's part, but it was done for good reasons, and I could see why that happened. Uh, community councils do not do the job that I am sure Wheatley intended them to do, simply because they were given no teeth, and simply because over the years they have... Uh, some of them have politicised, which they were never supposed to do. Others have been very good. I know in my authority I could go around the ones that are, have gone totally political and I could go around the ones who stick very rigidly to being non-political. But we must look at that, and I'm certainly quite happy to answer any questions on what would be the best way forward. In terms of the Provost Association, um, I've been involved in the Provost Association most of the seven years since I've been Provost. And uh, the point that I think I would like to get over to the committee and also to the Scottish Government is that I think the first five years that I was involved in it, we lost our way in many ways. And I don't think we were totally representative of the conveners, provosts in Scotland. Uh, what I would hope you would accept, that over the last year, uh, 18 months, and probably a lot to do with Graham's input into it, that in fact, I think the Provost Association has now come together a bit better. I th there are difficulties, particularly with cities, but uh, notwithstanding that, I think there is a feeling among the remaining conveners and provosts that we have an opportunity to let the voice of civic heads be heard. Uh, there will always be leaders and there will always be other councillors within local government who in fact think the civic role is a waste of time. But I would like to get one point over to the committee and also over to the Scottish Government and that is that in my seven years I'm less interested in the opinion of on this particular issue of my fellow councillors or even the opinion of MSPs or MPs. I know that people out there have a great deal of respect for the civic heads of the various authorities. When I go to attend things as provost, whether it be wedding anniversaries, 100th birthdays, whether it be events, whatever it is, and being projected as the non-political civic head, in fact, people out there, the general populace, respect that. And that is something that I think the Provost Association wants to try and emphasise and get that message over. Uh, I think we do have a role, and I think the association, in fact, uh, is going to be the mechanism for that. I wonder, in terms of civic and looking at the civic, I wonder if we did a, a straw poll in any of the local authority areas, mm -hmm. how many people would um, be able to tell you who the province was? And the board, they wouldn't know who the convener was. The in the boroughs that have honorary provosts, I think a lot of people. I travel across the borders, 1,800 square miles, do a lot of openings, Lord of Tenants, royal visits, citizenship ceremonies, visiting people in the communities, community councils. I don't, I suspect quite a large number, but you'd have to do a proper survey to get the proper answer to that. But more, more than I would have thought, actually, quite surprising how people are aware. And of course, the local newspapers in my area um, are very up, but I said the national papers don't take much interest. The local papers every week have us in, um, either the leader or the, or the convener or leading politicians locally on, on issues. So we are, our pictures are in the press a lot. I'm sure that Tom will repeat that. I think so. it would vary. Sorry, I think it would vary from authority to authority. Yeah. Certainly in my authority, uh, and I'm not conceited in any way whatsoever, uh, I would suggest that I'm probably better known than the local MSPs or MPs. But I'm lucky. I'm in a, a, an area which has maybe five traditional towns as a major new town, and um, I get around all these areas. There may be other areas where your, your question would be answered in a different way. Uh, so I would say it would vary from, from authority to authority. So what could the Provost Association do? This, this idea that we were taking evidence from earlier about, about the, sort of, the civic and the civic engagement, civic pride, um, and the view that, that that's perhaps more important than, than, than a lot of other factors in terms of people feeling part of 
a local authority are feeling that it's worthwhile going out and voting. So how would you see, what would you see the Provost Association being able to achieve in terms of trying to promote civic, given that's what you are, the civic heads of, of these, these, these council areas? Well, I'm not doing civic and lo local government, as I said in my initial remarks. Um, people are daft. They, they know where the controls and powers are in government. Uh, the last election in Gallant Shields was a 29% turnout. They know the powers have been taken away from local authorities. I know, I know you've been examining that, Chairman. So, but they still regard the local authorities as important because we deliver services on a daily basis, but they realise that uh, the real exercise of power is elsewhere. Communities are interesting things. I, I, you, you've, said and you've said it a number of times now, the powers that have been taken away yeah. from local authorities... Can you give us examples of the powers that have been taken away? So glad you asked me that question. Um, in my direct personal experience as a local authority chief officer and now as a councillor, since the 1970s there's been a large number of powers. I've listed them here. There's about 10 or 12. i just quickly tell you them, Chairman. In the 1970s, housing associations were set up. I'm not saying it's a good thing or a bad thing. It's just a fact. They were set up and housing authorities, the running of council houses, and part, large parts of the country went into housing associations with the setting up of the Housing Corporation and Housing Associations in the 1970s and 80s. Further education colleges, colleges used to be run by councils, and they were taken away in the 1980s. Tourism uh, was taken away in the 1990s from the local tourist boards to visit Scotland. Water and sewage, 1996. Uh, first to three water boards, then to Scottish Water laterally. Environmental protection away in 1996 uh, to SIPA. Uh, economic development in part, uh, local enterprise companies uh, disappeared into two enterprise uh, companies for Scotland. Uh, fire and rescue went uh, last year. Police went last year. And of course, perhaps worst of all, the determination of the local council tax has been out of our hands for seven years. So these are some examples, in my experience, where local authorities have been diminished in the, the powers that they've discharged. And of course, before that, as the Professor mentioned, um, just after the war, they were the, the energy authority. They provide town, town, town uh, energy to, to gas and electricity supplies. Not that I'm suggesting it goes back to that. These are just facts. Over the years, successive governments have done that. And I think it's going to an extent that people realise that and wonder why they bother, why bother voting local government at all. It's fair to say that most of these uh, that you have mentioned have taken place at points where there have been major local government reorganisations. No, not true. Just one, just the two, uh, water and sewage and environmental protection in 1996. The others were outside reorganisations. In the 70s scenario? No, housing associations, uh, housing corporation was set up outside the reorganisation of local government in 1975. That was separate, separate in parallel, but separate from the organisation. Councillor Kerr, do you want to comment on that? Yes, I, I, I would agree with Graham uh, completely. I think his analysis of these various um, services centralising is, is, is factual. What I would uh, say in addition to that is we're not, I'm not trying to make a case to reinstate them. Uh, it's just stating a fact on centralisation. I certainly would not be in favour of a lot of these things necessarily coming back under local control. Yep, Alec. What sometimes amazes me is that, and I should say that up until January I was the leader of Fife Council, what, what absolutely amazes me is that local government are delivering services that do impact on people's lives every day, their lives, education, social work, housing, um, getting, getting the bins emptied, street cleaning, the local environment. I mean, local government is is the, gov the level of government, the theory government that is impacting on people's lives every day of their lives. And I agree entirely that there is a perception out there that, that it perhaps isn't as, as important as this place. I mean, that's not actually a view I share, but, but I can see that there is, there is, there is a, a, a perception of that. But it's, how do you actually turn that around, given that, that local government is, is the thing that people will have most contact with day in and day out? Well, my, my view is, if the service is very really well, that's fine. Well, if there's a crowd pull, if something goes wrong, as someone was saying earlier on, people will start complaining or come, turn up, propose to close something. But if everything's running well, they don't want to be engaged. And I've noticed um, um, that people now have got, rather than spatial communities where they live, they have communities of interest with social networks and the web and all that. 
And I think it's an interesting change in dynamic going on in society at the moment that their, their, their loyalty uh, to the local community is not as I remember. When I was, you know, it was absolutely crucial when I was being brought up. Now it's more on communities of interest, what their interest might be, whether it's nationwide or worldwide. So there's a change going on as to what people use their time in doing. And just to answer, to repeat, if the services are running well, then there'll be nobody interested. No one will come to an area forum or a community council. It's only when things go wrong, there's a problem. That's when the press pick up as well. Why did I agree with the professor? But fantastic what local government does day in and day out, affecting people's lives in very good ways all of the time, only when there's something goes wrong that people shout about that. And we should emphasise that time and again. We are very lucky. I've worked in very bad parts of the world. You know, having this kind of meeting would be unheard of, for example. Um, we are so lucky what we have. So what we're doing here is embellishing a bit what we have and looking at it again. But let, let's be so pleased about the country that we live in. We are so lucky. And I think people realise that who travel as well. Okay. Yes, I would agree with that. I think to, to make the electorate more conscious of what local government does, and I think that's really where you're coming from and, and appreciate it, uh, appreciation of what local government does. I think we go back to what the professor earlier was saying and the doctor, and we are in many ways saying the same thing, that we really have to think, and this really is up to this committee to take on board all the evidence that you've had, how are you going to get, how are you going to reverse a situation where local democracy in many ways just does not exist? Like West Lothian Council, it's probably one of the smaller ones, and we're 170,000, 172,000 of a population. How can we get local uh, feeling back at a lower level? And that will not be easy. That will not be easy, because uh, in my town, I could declare UDI tomorrow, and I'm sure I would get 100% vote for that, but that certainly would not be a positive way forward. There are other areas that would not operate on the same basis. Uh, so it, it, uh, I think that the real discussion, as far as local government is concerned, is how can you get that local democracy with uh, the tools on particular services, you know, the, 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 to, to, to be seen by the, the, the local electorate. I think there are things like external environment or whatever you want to call it, maintenance of playgrounds, it depends which authority you're in. Uh, that type of thing could quite easily be done at a much smaller level, mm -hmm. simply because you can get a great deal of the third sector or the volunteer sector to link into that. And if they knew at a local level that they had a budget mm -hmm. and there were people there that they could approach, uh, then I think that that would be one way of doing it. Now, there are some towns... Okay, so Obviously, you have the abilities at this moment in time to devolve those budgets down to, to whatever level. And in some places that the committee has visited um, uh, in past inquiries that we've made, some local authorities are very, very good um, at, uh, at giving local folks uh, the resource to be able to do the kind of things that you're saying. In other places... Um, budgets are held very much uh, centrally. So what is to stop you at this moment in time from doing some of the things that you're saying, well, giving the, your town the ability to spend money on, on maintenance of playgrounds or, or grounds maintenance or whatever it may be? Why, why, why are you not doing that now? You're quite right, and we do that in West Lothian. We do, in fact, allocate to the towns a town centre capital programme. That is then discussed at town centre management groups, it's discussed by the, the community council and it's discussed by the local area committees. Uh, but the one thing that we have not gone to the stage is of giving them the authority and the power to issue a contract. Now, maybe that is something that we are behind other authorities on, but I, I think it will only become meaningful if the local area committee, or whatever you want to call it, you can put whatever title you like on it, doesn't only have the allocation of capital or the allocation of money, but they also have the authority to go out and get three quotes for a job, say, and use the their, 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 their money that have been allocated uh, the way they want to use it. Now, that, that we already go, I could say at the moment, we're going halfway to that. Uh, 
John Lawson, please. Thank you, Good Morning. Uh, I'm still trying to work out the difference between the civic heads and the council leaders. And I agree with Convener Garvey that we have seen a change in differences in local government and how local government has been delivered. Uh, but we've also seen political changes in local government. And I remember when the provost was quite a, an influential position within the council, and then all of a sudden we seemed to get this move from provosts to council leaders, and the council leader became the civic head of a local authority. Is this not, just not a dispute between the position of provost, or in your case, convener Garvey, between the conveners and the council leaders? Because at the end of the day, the provost and conveners of local authorities are political appointees. Councillor Garvey. That's a very good question. I think we've just worked it out. I can't speak for everyone, although I should. I haven't consulted all the membership. Uh, from my own knowledge, uh, it, we make it work. Um, and I think it's been an important and a useful development in local government to have this separation, not the least of which is time commitment. Uh, I spend a lot of time doing non a political work in the communities. We mentioned some of them. When we had a combined post in the borders of leader and and um, and convener, he just couldn't do it all. So that that in itself was reason to, to separate them out. Of course, there are occasions when politics comes into the job I do. For example, I actually chair the administration meetings. That was a slightly um, interesting thing to be asked to do. Actually, it works. It gives me an inside knowledge. The only one meeting I do outside the council is this chairing of this once a month. And I get a feeling for the issues which helps me when I'm becoming an independent chair of the council meeting to understand those issues better. But relationships, disputes, doesn't exist. We make it work between us, um, and I think that's true of most of the councils, to make it work for the benefit of the people. There must have been room for that, but it's developed into, I think, a very good practical working relationships, recognising distinct and important roles. Okay. Yes. And that, yep. from Convener Garvey, is that because Scottish Borders is a coalition administration and there's more freedom for you and your role as a convener to actually carry out that civic head function uh, than it would be, say, in another authority, say, Glasgow or North Lanarkshire, where the administration is dominated by one party? Um, yes, there's only the two councils, I understand, in Scotland who are not coalition arrangements. It's just those two you mentioned. I have no knowledge of how Glasgow and North Lanarkshire operate. But, uh, you have to ask them. I honestly don't know the answer to that. But coalition, in my experience, coalitions in talking to colleagues in the vast majority of councils, which are coalitions, that's the way it works. I think there's a couple of councils, maybe a couple of the islands, who still have the combined political head and the convener, but it is unusual. The norm is to separate these two out in coalition councils. Councillor Kerr. Yes, I think, I think the big change did come probably when STV came in and um, it ended up that we had um, very few majority councils, party majority councils, uh, and the role started to, 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 to change. Uh, I've been on council where it has been a majority party, for the last seven years, we have had uh, no party with overall control. Uh, and I've had experience of being an administration with two different parties uh, the, for five years with one and now with a different party uh, in, in this present ad, uh, administration. And I think it's... And, and there is sometimes a conflict, but a great deal depends on the individual as well. And the individual's got to... Uh, for example, and I, it's perhaps wrong for me to personalise this, but after an election, the last two elections, my overall consideration was that we had an administration that would last for five years. That was my overall, and I wasn't really worried who that administration was. But it wasn't to be an administration that flipped and flopped and flipped and flopped every six or nine months. Now, if you, if you start off from that philosophy, then it's easy. Uh, now, I'm... I'm working with two different, have worked with two different leaders, and we have to set out our roles. But there is absolutely no doubt, as Graham says, that the role of the civic head is, is clear. And probably I am better known within West Lothian than the leader of the council is. Albeit that the leader of the council is the political leader. 
And I don't know if that, that answers your question, but there's, when you get ad, uh, um, administrations which are of two or three different complexions, it comes down to the individuals, how, how they form the administration. Mm -hmm. And the civic head has a very important role. I just chaired a council meeting yesterday uh, where I, had, I abstained on three votes in the chair simply because I couldn't agree with either the motion or the amendment put forward by two different parties. But there are occasions where, as the civic head, I've got to mediate that. Uh, I won't tell you other things that went on at that council meeting, which weren't very nice if the public had been present, but <laughs> uh, there is uh, a distinctive role for us. Can I stop you there? Yes. Can I take Mr Wilson in, but you just made a point there um, about... Um, it, it wouldn't have been very nice if the public had seen what had gone on at that meeting. Yeah. Now, there are things like that which could be said in many council chambers across the country. Do you think it's that kind of thing that makes the public disengage from uh, participating uh, in the system? No, I don't think the public know that the meeting was going on. Yet that was this monthly or six-weekly full council meeting. They, they wouldn't even know it was going on. Going back to what we were talking earlier, when you're at that lower level... Uh, whatever that be, be town council, whether it be a local area committee or whatever, there are more people turn up to our local area committees than turn up to the full council. Thank you. Just following on from that, I'm trying to get, because this inquiry is about the flexibility and autonomy of local government, it's, apart from the example you gave Provost Kerr about the meeting yesterday, what other influences do you think the conveners of Provost can have as civic heads, to convince the public that there is a change and that you have that power to make the changes that people may look for in relation to engaging with local government? Because the, I think our convener, the convener Stuart, they, they made the point about how we engage and how we interact with the public is very important, that no matter what elected position you're in, whether that be council, MSP or MP. But as a civic head, are you in danger of raising expectation about what you can deliver for the people of your community? And you've said, both said it, these are bo both better known than MSPs and MPs in your local area because of, well, well, Professor Scher said it. Uh, but how do, you, how do you get translate that civic function role in engaging with communities to one whereby communities then start engaging with the councils? Councillor Garvey. It seems to me, Chairman, we're here talking about the health of local government in Scotland. That's what I see we're about. I talk to my daughter's generation. She's a professional solicitor. Why are you guys not getting involved in local government? Oh, how much do you pay? 17 grand a year basic for all the hassle. Oh, no, I'm doing that. We've got to look at this. Do we want to have a meaningful system of local government here, or do we not? No matter what the civic head does or the leader. What matters is what the next generation are saying about us, and they're saying we're not engaged, either voting or standing. You talk to any political party, they're all saying the same thing. Can I get the right people? Now, we've got to look at that. It seems to me, it's either a professional job or it isn't. I think it's a professional job. 17,000 very nice part-time. It's actually almost full-time in some cases. Our leader doesn't get much more than a, a, a rising professional starting off their careers. So I think you have to have a long, hard look at what are we about here, getting people involved, when we're going to pay them, you get what you pay for, you're going to think about maybe reducing the number of councillors, my colleagues might not like that, but if we can't pay any other way, we've got to tackle this, otherwise local government is going to disappear down the sinkhole. And I've been involved in the system for many, many years, and I'm extremely concerned. I wouldn't be in this job today before you unless I was really concerned about where we're going. So... Sorry to dodge your question, Mr Wilson, but I think it's a broader thing to be examined here by both the COSLA Commission and by yourselves and by ourselves. Where the heck is local government going? Is this the right model for a modern Scotland? I don't think it is. And I think these are the issues we ought to be looking at. Sorry to be so strong about that. I just feel we have to tackle a fundamental thing. How I engage with the community, I'll just do it fine. Go to festivals, do citizenship ceremonies. Do it. That's perimeter, peripheral to what I've just said to you. He's being uh, okay. <laughs> given over here. Uh, Councillor Kerr. Yes, thank you. Um, well, I think um, I'm going to put some of this back on to yourselves because you, you, you are a committee who are um, deliberating over 
the future of local government and going to make recommendations to the, to, to, to the Scottish Parliament. Um, from the province role, uh, what we do, and certainly what I do, is I promote West Lothian. I don't promote Linlithgow, I don't promote Bathgate, Whitburn, Livingston, I promote West Lothian. And, and that's all I can do, a civic head, as someone when I've got that chain on is representing the people of West Lothian, I'm going to promote our local authority. And I'm going to encourage at every opportunity comment to the local authority. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's coming down to giving some control, some real control at a local level. And I'm hoping what will come out, that's when you'll get more participation from people locally. You'll get a better understanding from people locally. Uh, if, for example, if our local areas committees in West Lothian had real power, and you could turn that back on me and say, why don't you give them real power? Why don't you, make them, why don't you allow them to, to make decisions? Why don't you allow them to issue contracts? Uh, then you could put that back on me, certainly. But I know that a lot of my colleagues would fight against that. But nevertheless, you're going to make recommendations to the Scottish Parliament. That may come forward as a bill, which I hope it will, and there'll be proposals in that bill. Uh, all I would ask you is that do something. You're, you're taking a lot of evidence here. Do something that is going to allow local authorities, as they are. I'm not for changing the present 32 or 33. We've heard the Shetland thing, and I'm sure there are some areas where we'd like to, to, to break off and to bring the airships together. We've heard that. That is something that you can decide. But as far as um, I'm quite content with the size of some of these authorities at the moment, some are bigger, some are smaller, some are operating well, some are not operating quite so well. But that can remain if we can get something at a lower level. Now, I, I think it will be extremely difficult for this committee to generalise on that. So you'll have to come up with something that allows a West Lothian or an Aberdeenshire or a Borders to, in fact, to be able to do that. Now, whether it be local area committees, whether it be, I think the community councils would be the wrong way to go. I think they've, they've, they've had now 30 years, no, more than that. Uh, they've had 39 years and the name itself, the community council name itself does not carry a lot of credibility. Uh, I think you have to change that. Uh, but you have to get that down. Interesting, we've heard mention of community councils, and yet this is the 40th, coming up for the 40th anniversary of community councils in Scotland, which were established around the time of reorganisation in 1974-75. Surely part of the debate about community councils is they have not been given the place they were expected to have had within the structures of local government within government circles because when we saw the changes that took place in 1975 when we established the done away with the borough councils established you know, the, the town councils and we established the regional councils there was an element at a grassroots there that we expected community councils to be able to deliver but my experience and some of the experience we've heard from evidence is that community councils were never ever treated with the, either the authority or the respect they should have actually received at that time. So therefore, the, to actually say community councils have not delivered may be part of a, an issue for local government to look at in the way that they actually dealt with community councils and continue to deal with community councils. Um, I knew Lord Wheatley, the friend of my father, and I discussed it as a young man with him what this was about. The idea of a community council came from the province uh, of Selkirk, Selkirk Town Council. And Wheatley said to me, I remember it well, he said, we had to put something in place to make sure the town, the boroughs and the towns had something. But it should be looked at again, he said. And that's a long time ago that was said. Mm -hmm. So, and the statutory function was a single function to ascertain, to coordinate and express the views of the community which they represent. Very few of them do that. They're not funded to do that. 
So that in itself is a role they've not fulfilled because of no money. So that could be, that could be strengthened. But I, I agree very much with Tom. We ought to be looking at some statutory way of empowering localism, whether it's a community council concept or a slightly wider, wider concept of groupings of communities, empowering them statutorily to deliver, or the local authorities to put in place a scheme for them to deliver some of their services. That would go some way to uh, re-energising local interest in actually cutting the grass, looking after cemeteries, cleaning the streets, that kind of thing. Uh, that, that's the way I think you should look at, Chairman. It's something you might recommend at some stage. Sorry, Tom, you, maybe you should have answered that. No, no it's, uh, I'd agree with Graham. Uh, that what I would say is that I would be really concerned if the outcome of your, your investigation and what you ended up doing was, um, and I'll probably get absolutely murdered by community councils around the area, uh, I would be quite distressed uh, if what came out was boosting the power of community councils. Now, I know that that is an in thing to, to say, I know it's a populist thing to say, but I'm afraid after 40 years that attitude of members of the public locally to community councils in my area is not good. In 40 years in West Lothian, there has been one election to one community council in 40 years, and we got a massive 9% turnout. <laughs> now, the credibility of the name uh, is gone. Uh, now, if you wanted to change it in some way through, through, through legislation, that there was a, a, a local area committee, whatever you wanted to call it. Uh, and within that legislation, the existing local authorities had the, to hand budget over to them, which, of course, you would very generously pass down to us from, from the Scottish Parliament. Um, then I think these local area committees, or whatever you want to call them, would, in fact, be able to deliver services. I'm repeating a lot of what I've said, but I've got serious reservations about community councils and the name. And my point flows on quite nicely from what we've just been discussing, and it, it, it's around how communities choose to organise uh, and engage. And I think you've rightly identified that community councils, broadly speaking, do not have the levels of involvement and engagement that any of us would want to see but there are other means out there in communities through which people become active become involved and often as we as we all know people will only become active if an issue directly impacts and affects them a school closure for example will see a huge amount of engagement from a local community but the minute that that issue is resolved one way or the other many of these people will never be seen again at a public engagement event because they feel they've fulfilled their role. So are, are we maybe putting too much hope on the notion that you can get people to actively engage? Um, do we need to look very carefully at how people engage and why people engage first and foremost before we reform any means of local engagement? This is a very fundamental comment, I may say so. Chairman, yes, society is changing. If you could do a piece of work on that to find out how that could be ascertained would be excellent. I think that you put your, put your finger on something really important there. I think that that difficulty and that problem relates not only to local government but it also relates to uh, central government as well, engagement, uh, understanding, etc. What I do think it would be much easier uh, to implement certain things at a local level and I was really interested in what the professor said about rather than the looking down on top uh, looking up from the bottom uh, in terms of, of change and uh, engagement uh, at a local level is much easier um, if you already have many voluntary groups and I know in my area uh, in the town uh, one voluntary group has effectively taken over 50% of the, the, how could I say, the, ex, the grounds, the no, grounds, not grounds maintenance, but the, for example, flower beds, hanging baskets, etc., etc. And I'm sure that happens to other mm -hmm. in other towns and areas as well. Uh, now that, with a local area committee, with a budget, would be where they would go uh, for that help, whether it be help in kind or whether it be financial help, uh, rather than. Looking for coming to West Lothian Council 
uh, based in Livingston, which uh, is kind of distant to some of these, to some of the people in the other traditional towns. So I, I think that uh, you really have to give some authority at a lower level and let that feed up, and you will get engagement in some communities. Some communities you won't get any engagement at all because they don't want to be interested, really that interested. But if you give them something that they can see happening at a local level, then uh, I think you'll get progress. Yeah, I mean, the, the professor also spoke about mindset, and I think that that, that chimed with me absolutely. Um, I mean, if I can, I could look at an example in my own area where I'd suggested to the local bus company that they uh, adopt a, a blank canvas approach to look at how bus services should be delivered, and it was anathema to them. They couldn't get their head around the concept. And you think that there's a reluctance out there to maybe take a blank canvas approach sometimes to look at what's being done and there's a feeling that um, it, it would be too risky to do something like that or it would be too difficult to, to reorganise and restructure things from a blank canvas approach rather than looking at what we already have and maybe making not making what would essentially become insignificant changes to be seen to be doing something. Blank canvases <clears throat> uh, are never there. <laughs> Uh, it's just the way it is. Um, nice to do that, but we, ha we, ha we have a good, what we've got and we are where we are. Interesting, you mentioned the bus is issue. We have a, a problem with that at the moment in the borders, and I was told the reason for changing timings and where the bus goes into Edinburgh instead of going to St Andrews Square, it goes to Water. It was all to do with shifts, the drivers' wages and shift patterns. So, you know, there's, there's not the blank canvas that, you know, I can understand the reaction of the bus company dealing with their, their, their drivers and so on. Um, we could do a theoretical exercise and see what happens, but I think the reality is we don't have blank canvases. Yes, uh, the blank canvas approach is, in, in, in general terms, it can be a good thing in certain areas. However, as an ex-engineer, if the thing ain't broke, don't fix it. Mm. So there are um, uh, things that do work very well. So sometimes to just take a blank canvas and start from scratch, you could be throwing the baby out with the bathwater as well. Uh, so I really think you have to look at what is working, what is good, and then uh, look at where the improvements can be made. And I think that can only be done at a very local level. It can't be done at the level of central government at the moment, not for, to satisfy individual areas. And certainly that is the, the message that I get through from all the areas that I attend in West Lothian. I think what I was driving from as well with that was that around uh, how local government is structured in Scotland and what powers rest with local government. And um, sometimes it's maybe a good idea to to divorce oneself from what is currently there or what has gone previously because th there has been a lot of talk about what existed previously in terms of local government and I think you've made the point and the point was articulated by the professors uh, by Professor Mitchell and Dr McClavery earlier that you don't necessarily want to go back to what was before it's merely illustrative uh, and there may be new things that could could come to local government in future that local government has has never had control of um, in in Scotland but in terms of uh, of that approach um, where do you get the feeling that, that local government needs to go in the future? And, and not in terms of necessarily identifying particular powers or particular structures, but is there a general trend or direction that needs to take place in local government in Scotland? Yes, sir. I can answer that, Chairman. Um, when I started local government, we had part-time councillors who ran businesses and they ran the local authorities. The perception they ran them pretty well. And there wasn't a lot of interest in standing. There were some wars not contested in various parts of the country. It's changed. The world's changed. You know, these people aren't around anymore to devote in their 50s the rest of their lives to public service. So what we have to address now is, is making local government councillors like MSPs and MPs a profession which is attractive. I've mentioned this before, Chairman. That's the direction of travel I see professionally and as an elected member professionally what we should be looking at very strongly. You get what you pay for, and um, we're not paying enough to attract people in who've got the brains, the variety of experiences, the professionalisms to bring to that table. I know we wish to be rude about any of my fellow 1,200 councillors, but I think we all know there are people in elected office who, who shouldn't be, who have not got much to bring to the table at all. Genuine. But we need to address that. Is this the right way to go forward, I would say, 
No, we have to look at the direction of travel, and I'm suggesting that's one possible way. To pick up on that point, because certainly my experience over a number of years in local government is that you get different types of councillors, and you have councillors who will be very vocal, will be at the heart of their local community, will be involved in other local committees, um, and you have other councillors who take that more professional approach and see their role as strategic. And is, is, is that no a difficulty there? Because you seem to be suggesting that in professionalising local government, it is the professionals at the strategic level, but what about the local representative who is very much working at the heart of their community? Well, the strategic person does both. The local person can't do both. But, you know, the chemistry are mixed to be got there. Um, maybe I'm in dangerous ground, but I just feel professionally there are people I've met throughout the whole system who have very little to offer and are not doing, conversely, uh, not doing strategic because they can't, but they're not doing local either. They're only there for the beer, you know. I've come across that in the past. So it's a general critique that I thought they were individualising that, but observing any other profession in the country, be you an architect or a lawyer or an engineer or whatever, you have to do what you're doing as a professor. Why shouldn't we do the same for elected members? Into a different area, Chairman. Yes, I could come back to the, uh, the original point. And I, only, I go partially along the same route as uh, Graham. Um, I do think that when you're dealing with budgets of four, five, six hundred million every year, uh, and um, that people making decisions and policy decisions at that, that particular level, you do, do really want to get good people in there. And I don't dispute that. Uh, my concern is that if you were to professionalise completely and give the appropriate salary to, to these people, You'd be as well to go over to the German system and just have the land rat, who in fact was the chief executive and the leader of the council, uh, uh, who is the same person. In other words, they directly employ uh, someone who has experience qualified in local government finance, qualified in, and, and he performs or she performs the, the, the same role. That's my only concern if you professionalise it too much. but. Uh, but I agree, uh, partially, but when you get to the lower level, as I have been saying all along, you don't need that type of professional. That's where you get the local person, that's where you get the people who, person who's genuinely interested in his local area or her local area uh, to get onto that uh, particular smaller body. Else? Mr MacDonald. Oh, Stuart McMillan, please. Thank you, convener, and uh, good morning, uh, gentlemen. Just a couple of questions. Um, uh, one of which is on the, uh, the issue of, uh, regarding just, well, the number and, and the structure of local authorities. Now, Councillor Kerr, uh, you stated earlier that, uh, that you don't think that there should be any change in the number. Um, but uh, in terms of yourself, Councillor Garvey, uh, what, what's your opinion on that? Well, I've been through two uh, reorganisations. They're terrible things. It does upset the whole thing for two or three years. In fact, Neil McIntosh told me there was one resolution, one issue never resolved between the 19... 75 of the 1996 reorganisation. So it's a huge upset. So I would never go in engaging in a reorganisation unless there was going to be measured value in a business case made for that. I think the last one was almost totally finance driven by the then uh, Secretary of State Ian Lang. So be careful what we do here. Having said that, we have to address these facts. Scotland has the fewest councils, the fewest councillors, the largest constituencies, the highest ratio between the population and, and councillors. The lowest proportion, most important this, the lowest proportion of the population engaged in local politics and the lowest turnout at council elections throughout the whole of Western Europe. That's serious. That is serious. So we are, sorry, sorry, Councillor Garvey, can I stop you because you said the fewest councillors, yeah. but earlier on you yeah. were arguing that the number of councillors should be reduced. Yeah, yeah, I am. I'm just talking. This is, the, this is the whole picture. All of this comes together. Just want by that point. Well, that was just a, a single issue at the time. You could, you could look, that's a way of funding, paying people more. That's one possibility. But in the round of local government in Europe, we are not faring well in our structure of how we do things. But to restructure the number, I would agree with Tom Kerr. I think to just leave with what we've got, but look at what we're about, how the councillors are appointed, uh, how, how we pay them, rather, what functions the councillors do, how councillors can work together. Ayrshire was mentioned at the moment in the borders, we are coming very close together with the health service and joint appointments 
the Joint Health Social Work Appointment, the Joint Public Health Director, all of that can be done within the present structure. I would, I would caution us as a country going down a further reorganisation. I think we could do a lot of the things we're all concerned about within the present structure. Not ideal, but let's do the structure some other time if we have to. Let's look at the internal operation and functions of local authorities. Uh, that kind of follows on in terms of the, kind of the functions of the local authorities. Uh, and earlier on in, uh, in your, your evidence, you highlighted uh, uh, where powers have actually, uh, in, in your words, were removed from local authorities, and one of which was on housing. Um, but what, uh, what would you say to, uh, certainly to us today, in terms of uh, the number of local authorities that have actually uh, undertook housing stock transfers to actually take the housing out of their own control. Now, that was their choice. It wasn't the choice of anyone else. But some of the likes of uh, leisure trusts or cultural trusts that, been, that uh, they've decided to take out uh, of their own control. Yeah, I'm not arguing for when we come back in. I'm just pointing out the facts of why how local government has been diminished. Each one of these should perhaps be re-examined with others as to what, what are the right funds to, to be run by local elected representatives and not by ex external uh, bodies like housing associations or culture and sports trusts. I'm not arguing for. I'm arguing for the case for local government, elected councillors representing the people, to be examined as a vital part of our democratic system. All I was saying there were examples of how it's been diminished. I'm not arguing one way or the other for any individual function. Some have been very successful. Um, uh, housing associations in the, the boards have been great success, but where is their accountability to local people? That's that's the issue for me. So there's a number of things to be teased out there, but no, I'm not arguing for any particular function. I'm arguing for local government to be looked at in the round. Yes, I, I did mention earlier that I did not want a major reorganisation of local government, and I stand by that. And there may be cases, as I've said, for Shetland and other areas, but. Uh, I agree with Graham that to go through that turmoil again, to go through that expense again, I think would be wrong. The co what councils can do and what councils at that level are doing is they are becoming more corporate. And I think that has yes. got to be encouraged. We have, two, we have three deputy chief executives. One of them is 50% paid by Lothian Health and 50% paid by uh, West Lothian Council. Um, uh, external trusts... Uh, you will not reverse that. Um, uh, several authorities in Scotland have leisure trusts. They, they, they save a tremendous amount of money. Uh, and I, 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 th I think it would be incorrect to call it a fiscal fiddle, but they, 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 they do save the public purse a huge amount of money in terms of um, VAT and in terms of non-domestic rates, etc. So that will not reverse. Uh, so... I think local government at that level can, in fact, look uh, and work within that size of authority. Where I do agree completely is the number of councillors, the number of elected representatives is, on the whole, low. And there has to be a compromise between the French system, where, I don't know, is it 3,500 mayors they have in France or something, some representing 300 people, some representing 10,000 people, uh, our twin town uh, in uh, Guyancourt in, in France uh, has a mayor, but that's a sizable new town. But there's a neighbouring area where they have a mayor for 300 people. There has to be a compromise somewhere. But they know who their mayor is. Going way back to one of the questions earlier on, they know who their representatives are at that level. So I don't want 3,500 mayors, which would probably end up with... 30,000 extra councillors, but I do think there is a strong compromise there that we can reach, and I hope the, the committee uh, do that. But to go into a major reorganisation, please, no, because I've been through, well, one of them, but while in local government, and the other one while I was interested in local government. <laughs> I've still got the scars to this day. <laughs> The, the other points that uh, has been raised today is uh, the issue of public engagement. Uh, and in the evidence that, uh, that we received uh, from the Accounts Commission, um, they stressed that, uh, and, and I'll quote, that there is significant potential for improvement by local authorities under existing arrangements and circumstances, such as in identifying good practice and engaging with citizens, better training for elected members and their responsibilities, uh, a right leadership culture, and in improving how performance is reported to citizens. 
uh, and also in the, the Voluntary Action Scotland, who will be giving the evidence also later, uh, and their submission to us uh, su suggested that participants insisted uh, on the need for greater transparency and openness in decision making pro and in the decision making process, so that everybody has the necessary information as well as knowledge on how to influence the process. Do you think these are fair comments? Well, I've not seen the evidence you're referring to, and I'm sure it varies across the country. Um, and I'm not, I can't consult with colleagues who are not here. My own experience, that is not the case in the Scottish borders. We have um, surveys of, of the whole population, a uh, sample of the whole population, every year, uh, every 18 months. And um, we, uh, being small areas, I mean, we walk, the council has walked down the streets on the days. We know the people that come up to us, all sorts of events in a relatively small population size area, 110,000. So I think we, we, we are made to be aware of what we're not doing right on a regular basis, whether it's a festival, community council, or, or rugby match, whatever it might be. So in my own case, I, I hear what that's been said. I hope I'm not being uh, too confident about that, but I just, I just don't recognise that criticism. We have moved a large, long way into communicating with the public and hearing, listening to what they're saying. We have set up a petitions committee. We actively encourage people to come forward to that committee to speak about any grievance they may have or issues they may have. So I really would have to see the evidence, which I've not seen, as to whether we're uh, guilty generally across Scotland. There must be there must be something that's bothering the Accounts Commission. I'm going to try and get uh, Cameron Buchanan in. So briefly, Councillor Kerr, if you've got anything to add. I think, I think, I think they're very good words, but I think they're very difficult to implement. Uh, we have tried... and. Uh, particularly with the economic situation over the last three or four years, we went through two major consultations locally, and I mean major consultations, through the newspaper that goes through every door, through um, all the groups within West Lothian, were invited to face-to-face -face meetings to discuss the proposals, big choices, uh, and I have to say that you cannot take a horse to water. You can take it to water, but you can't make it drink. And um, I'm afraid that it's, they're sound words, and it'd be great if someone could wave a magic wand to get that, the answer to that, a positive approach. Uh, but it's, it's difficult, but we shouldn't stop trying. Thank you. Councillor Garvey, you mentioned you had in the borders local provost, look, look provost yes. of, of um, in Hoyk and other places. Do they have the power, and what do they do? And do you think this is the answer maybe to, instead of mayors, you have local provosts? I understand there are certain towns have them, I think at Melrose, uh, Hoyk, Eyemouth, and it's honorary. It's fest festival time. Um, that there's no statutory power given to them. Some of them are cancelled, uh, In some cases, that's true. But, but um, I think the only I can think of actually is Hoyk. Hoyk, yeah. It's the only one in the entire borders where the, where the chairman or the honorary provost is an elected member. And do you think that's the answer to, to, to giving people more, to having more authority or rec name recognition? Which is what was earlier. What is your... Well, the point was recognition of who's in charge or who's, who's running the show. I you think said. it's a dual thing. I mean, um, the committee of the council and the provost of Hoyt, what's happened, the next two weeks we're doing a parade, but March past of the Royal Scots, with the Lord Lieutenant and the Colonel of the Regiment, all four of us are on the, the dais. And we take the salute together and afterwards at the lunch, the provost of Hoyt will say a few words and I'll say a few words. We're both known, so I'm not sure there's a problem with that at all. Um, can I thank you very much for your evidence uh, today, gentlemen? Um, and I suspend uh, for five minutes for a change of witnesses. Thank you.
Uh, we now move on to this morning's third panel. Uh, I'd like to welcome Rahir Shah, Policy Manager for the Scottish Council for Voluntary Organisations, and Callum Irving, Chief Executive for Voluntary Action Scotland. You're very welcome, gentlemen. Do you have any opening remarks that you'd like to make? Yes, Mr sir. Irving. I'd like to uh, kick off. There's kind of um, two, there's two aspects of this flexibility and autonomy of local government issue that's of interest to our network. Our network is the network of third sector interfaces in Scotland, so their role is very much about supporting the third sector in localities, but also building a bit of a bridge to the public sector, to local government and community planning in particular. And they have kind of two sides to their interest in this. The first is that they, they have um, a view about democracy per se and where we're going with that, that it shouldn't just be representative, that we now need to start looking at how we make it more participative, much more involving of, of local people and communities. But also they have an interest in this insofar as it relates to public service reform, particularly for local government, and how that's working and how that could be done in a more uh, participative way that makes the most of the assets and views of the third sector. So their interest in this is twofold, two types of participation, if you like, a better type of democratic participation, but also a better type of participation with the third sector, whereby its views and assets could be brought to some of the kind of public policy challenges that we face at the moment. Okay, Mr. Shah, do you have anything to add? Sure, yeah. I mean, I suppose the, the key question for us as a sector, SCVO is the umbrella body for the third sector in Scotland. The key question for us is what is local government for? And, uh, you know, it's, it, up until recently, no one's really been asking this. It's all been about how we kind of change and tweak the, the current system. Now, traditionally, the third sector over the last few years has had a, its interest in local government has been primarily, primarily around funding, its funding arrangements. So how is it resourced by local government? But I think increasingly we've realised as a sector that a lot of the work we do, a lot of the work we do that we, to support the people and communities we work with actually fundamentally does depend on how local government organises itself and supports that activity itself. So I think that's where our interest has come in, and it opens up a whole range of questions which have only, we've only just started to explore as a sector in Scotland because we're, we're transitioning from, from thinking just about the funding uh, relationship to this broader relationship. So, for example, should local government uh, be enablers of public services, for example, or should they be big employers? Many local government, local authorities and councils see themselves as big employers in the areas. Um, should they be, local government, be about controlling services? Or should they be maintaining an overview of services? Or, alternatively, as, some, as many in our sector are now coming to the conclusion, how could local government focus instead on creating the right kind of conditions for people in communities uh, to support each other, to create and own their own services? So I, th I think part of the problem is that we've fallen into a situation where local government is uh, primarily seeing its core role around delivering statutory services, and in, in some ways, over, over the years, this has become an albatross around its neck. You know, so we've had, as a result, that risk aversion. There's been a loss of creativity. There's been an incre increase in bureaucracy. And, uh, and yet, as a public, indeed even from the sector itself, we keep clamouring for more and more statutory services. So we've got ourselves into this situation where, where we, we find local authorities, particularly under austerity, talking about essential statutory service and then the non-essential bits, which tend to be the kinds of activities that many organisations and our members in SCVO are involved in. So that's the kind of debate we want to move away from and very much move to a much more positive debate about how local government's role and purpose uh, in supporting people to be able to create and own their own services. Now, I have to admit freely that even in our own sector, as a third sector, we have got our own vested interests. There many, uh, there's, there's many of our own members have built up an entire uh, professionalism model uh, mindset about how they could deliver public services under contract with local government in certain ways, and, and, they have, and that's become their core business. And so in many ways, it's a challenge to ourselves as a sector if we're going to think about how local government organises itself, we need to think about how our own sector organises itself as well. Thank you very much uh, for that. As, we, uh, as some of us went around Europe, uh, we asked the, questions, uh, the question, how uh, do you engage with the public? How do you try uh, and maximise participation uh, in decision-making? And it has to be said that we very often got blank looks 
because for them it was just the norm for, for these things to happen. Um, as we have been going round the country, and not just in this inquiry but in other inquiries, what we've found is that communities um, who are really engaged have uh, pretty high levels of control, um, including uh, budgetary control. I'm interested in the, the report by um, Dr Oliver Escobar, um, which uh, says uh, that the forum argued for citizen empowerment, people as producers, not just consumers. Um, I, I, is it the case that, um, that sometimes we don't make uh, best use of the folks that we have on the ground, don't allow them to make the decisions, don't allow them to follow the public pound, sometimes they're much better than it, at it than politicians, in my opinion. How do we improve on that? Obviously, Mr Irving, you'll have a view because your organisation was involved in that report. Y yes, absolutely. And I, and I noted that um, two, two or three of my colleagues from, um, I think it was from the Western Isles and, and Orkney, came to speak to you. And I think that's some of the points that they were trying to make, is that they're very often trying to help some of the resources in the third sector, i.e. people, uh, to bring some of their capacity and support to some of the policy challenges challenges we face. The, 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 there's a number of barriers to why that doesn't happen uh, uh, more often. Um, and, and, but some of them are about top-down design. Um, if, if you design something from Scottish government level all the way down through local government and then you prescribe how it must work at the local level, it's very hard if you're a kind of smaller end of the third sector to see how A, you would influence that and B, how you would actually be able to bring some of your, your, your resources, some of your personal strengths and knowledge to be able to support, support that public service. Um, or that, that kind of activity that you're seeking to, that outcome that you're seeking to achieve locally. If I can use an example, which I'll, I'll, I'll maybe um, share after today, we, we often point to reshaping care for older people agenda because it gave, it's regarded by the TSIs as offering, if you like, a, a, a ray of hope because the way it worked was it, it involved um, sign-off for the third sector via the third sector interface, which created a responsibility on the public bodies locally and the third sector interface to work in a very empowering and engaging way with, uh, with local communities in the third sector. And some of the best examples in that include quite a bottom-up design of what would that reshaped care look like, what services that older people want, what is it they need, but also what could they then contribute to that themselves? Because as we know, older people have resources, talents and abilities that can be brought to some of the challenges that we face. One of the classic examples of that is befriending services. That's quite common in the third sector. It's very low cost, but actually it can have, have a hugely uh, uh, powerful, um, if you like, preventative effect on some of the kind of issues of isolation with, with older people. So that's a form of participation that I think it is within our powers in Scotland to encourage more of at the moment. But because we don't allow that kind of more community-led design of things, it, it only happens on a kind of marginal basis at the moment. So it happened under reshaping care because there was, A, there was sign-off for the third sector, there was a clear role for the third sector, but also because there was money available, there was money on the table additional to what, uh, what was available to the public bodies locally. So if you like, it, it, was a, it was a space in which that could happen. Now, what we'd like to see is to see that happening more routinely ac across the board. Uh, you hit upon a number of points. And first of all, um, I'd like to, to go back to evidence that I think you were in for the last panel. Um, and Councillor Kerr um, basically called for legislation to establish local area committees, even though local authorities have the power to do that now. Um, and you, say, you yourself just now said that we shouldn't prescribe or lay down legislation from government or from this place to create these things. Do you think that it would be a good idea for this committee to recommend that we uh, create the kind of uh, local committee tier um, that Councillor Kerr um, was talking about? Do you think that prescription of that would actually work? 
Um, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm less sure about what the exact structural prescription should be, but certainly, as, as, as Oliver Escobar's paper uh, points out, there is, there is something about um, the closeness of um, the decision making that happens that affects the ability for, for people, for smaller aspects of the third sector to be involved. Um, I wouldn't like to say what that exact prescription would be because what's more important to me is how does it work? Does it come down in a sort of very prescribed way or can you do it in a way that actually engages people and the third sector locally and support them to do that because it takes resources to do engagement properly, support them to do that so you get a bit of co-design going on, you get a bit of a, of, of a stronger uh, influence happening in that creating the cultural space to do that is a much better way to do it. I'll just give you one quick example of what I think you're doing already to try and help with that, that I would encourage you to extend is procurement is, is obviously being reformed at the moment. If we only see, I think Richard started to, to, to touch on this, if we only see the third sector as something that we buy, that it provides a service like others we buy, as vitally important as that is, then then we miss out the other things that it can that it can bring to the table, and you get a very kind of a, a hierarchical purchased relationship, which I think is kind of missing out the other things that it can provide. Okay. One of the other things which you said in your evidence just now was that we don't allow um, certain things. Um, having been in local government myself before coming here. Um, it was often I was often told that oh we can't do that, um, and then I would ask the question why can't we do that? What is the difficulty in doing that? Can we not do it um, for legislative reasons? Or and quite often there was no difficulty in doing something at all. So the the don't allow um, what you mentioned is that because people are stuck in a rut doing things um, in ways that they've always done it rather than. Uh, not being allowing to do it, allowed to do it, they're choosing not to do it. Would that be? I think I think there's a bit of that. I do think there's a little bit of um, risk aversion, um, which comes from, um, and underneath that risk aversion, sometimes um, called TSI colleagues that came to visit you beforehand were pointing this out, and this is often felt by a lot of TSIs. Although they've they've done a, a lot of work to build relationships locally, there's still a slight parity of esteem thing. There's still a sort of a power and, and, and control thing going on, um, whereby I don't think there's enough trust there yet in order to say that 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 alternative way of doing things that's being suggested might actually be it might actually be an, an improvement. Now, what systemic change could lead to lead to a difference in that? I'm I'm less sure at this stage. You know, um, a lot of a lot of people in our network point to point the finger at um, finance and legal services as being a little bit of a barrier to some of the more liberated and creative approaches that might be available. Um, so, what the committee could suggest you do about that, I'm not so sure. It's very interesting, and finance and legal folk would say that the barrier often lies with the folk who are doing a procurement rather than with them. Uh, but I, I think we'll, we'll maybe leave that one just now. Mr Shah, we, um, we visited the Western Isles just a uh, week before last, um, and we were basically told by uh, the voluntary sector and community organisations there um, that... Uh, the islands probably wouldn't function uh, without the level of volunteering um, uh, third sector and community input that there is there. Um, and I'm quite sure that there are many other communities in Scotland um, where uh, that is a, a similar situation. Um, and yet the community groups, the third sector, did not feel um, that they, their views were being given due cognizance to by the local authorities. Is that still the case, do you think, in, in many parts of the country? And how can we improve that situation? It absolutely is the case. I mean, we, we, we've known for many years from our own research at SCVO that uh, <clears throat> the number of organisations per head in, in more dispersed uh, population areas in Scotland, in rural areas and in the islands, uh, is much higher. And, and we, uh, we know from uh, experience and from some of the work we've done with government and others that uh, in many areas the voluntary sector 
holds up public services in some of the more dispersed population areas in rural and island areas. So very much uh, a core part of the community in, in those areas. But I, I, I think uh, in, in terms of some of the barriers uh, to that, I, I think sometimes we look at this the wrong way around. And, and, and you know, th there is this emphasis that we keep seeing all the time about community engagement and uh, the third sector being an interlocutor for community engagement with communities. Now, firstly, um, I don't think the third sector can play that role. Uh, third sector organizations are essentially people coming together to try and make change in, into their local environment, into their local circumstances. That's at the heart and the root of what a third sector organization is. And I think uh, we, we have this idea of, of community engagement being the way in which uh, communities can ex exercise some kind of control over their services or some or some some kind of decisions that are made about them but i would argue quite strongly and we've made, we've been quite consistent about this that the focus for many people in the third sector many people that our third sector works with is around community empowerment it's about how you empower people and communities to make change happen it's not about community engagement and the two are not the same thing community empowerment is not the same as community engagement so i mean key questions for us would be how do we ensure that people in marginalized communities get equal access to decision making, uh, power and control over their lives, uh, you know, compared to more vocal, better resourced communities. You, you mentioned in your, in your question to uh, Callum um, about the local area committees model. Again, you know, if, if that's simply going to be the same people coming along to the committees and, and offering their views, how do you ensure that those who are more marginalized uh, don't get a say in there. We've seen the, the kind of elective turnouts in, in Governor Shettleston in the by-elections there. I think they were in the high 10s and low 20s. So clearly that kind of model doesn't really work. I would actually argue that instead of looking at this in terms of how you bring in people to the local authority or to the local government to try and influence decisions, it's about how you turn that around. So how does, uh, um, what kind of organized activities should public authorities invest in in order to enhance local democracy and community action? We see a really pivotal role as we think about this for local governments and local authorities in their representative role to play a very strong supportive role to the kind of participative democracy that uh, Callum was alluding to earlier. It's a really essential role. This is not about, uh, we, we don't want to have a situation where we try and talk up uh, the third sector and, the, and, and what happens in community life in opposition to what local government does. And, and all the, the, question, the, the question exchange we had earlier around uh, you know, the finance and legal people getting in the way. And you know, I think this, this all speaks to the kind of risk aversion and us and them mentality that's been built up over the years. If we think of all of ourselves as individuals, as people, uh, rather than as a sector or this sector or that sector. We think of all ourselves as people that have a stake in public services and we, we try and influence those public services, whether it's through our uh, work in, in public authorities or whether it's through our work through community organisations. Many of us wear multiple hats. Then it kind of freezes up from some of that. Thank you very much. Cameron Buchanan, please. Thank you very much. Thank you, Karina. I'm just going to ask about, you said, how can we improve uh, our community Councils, do you think that because the third sector is not represented in these community councils, do you think they should be? Do you think that would strengthen this community engagement? You, you spoke about community engagement on the community councils. Do you think they're the vehicle for engaging the third sector? It's not the vehicle, it's, it's a vehicle. I think community councils can play a role, as do many other uh, expressions at, at, at a local level. You, you can see the role played by development trusts, by TSIs, by uh, campaign groups. Many of these are sometimes in opposition to each other. That's part of a healthy democracy. So I wouldn't say that you, 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 you try and identify one vehicle, be it a community council or something else, as the, the only way of doing something. We submitted uh, some evidence uh, we, uh, to the uh, COSLA Commission on Local Democracy, which we shared with this committee as part of your evidence uh, request. Uh, and in, that, in the appendices, we've given a couple of examples of how we might see some of this in action. Uh, and one example is from Rwanda, which you might think is an unlikely place you might want to learn from in Scotland. But I think it absolutely is those kinds of radical examples that we need to look to. And in Rwanda, they have uh, a model of, uh, which is very similar to a, a community council model, with, uh, but it, it takes a slightly different twist to it. I, and uh, it, it, it organizes itself in a slightly different way. So that there are other opportunities, other ways which we can look at things. But I would certainly not say that, that you know, we, we try and look at who's representing the community and try and identify a vehicle for that. It's, this is at, the, at the end of the day, this is about people in their communities and how we support them to make decisions to their agendas. 
Yeah, again, it's, 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 I would get concerned if we got fixated on one particular part of a structure being, you know, if you like, re-engaged or, or re-strengthened or whatever, when actually what, what we do know is that with the existing structures, um, that you, there are approaches available that could actually uh, strengthen community empowerment and community engagement. So one of the interesting ideas that we heard in, in the Commission on, on Local Democracy was where is the place for citizens' juries in, in the system at the moment? That would be a more participative way of bringing in voices because what you're doing, a citizens' jury, is a deliberative and educative process and it can be used to, if you like, bring people into scrutinising things in the, way that, in the way that all of you do, who otherwise would not be involved. I've been involved in setting them up and running them in, in poorer parts of the northwest of England a few years ago, and we, we did it in one area where we were told, you can't do that there, it won't work, nobody will come. That's because nobody tried an approach like that where people might be able to actually get involved, see the influence of what they're doing. So, so there are mechanisms, there are approaches just now that could be better injected into the system and supported that I think could actually make the system create a more participative edge to democracy that, than we have at the moment. Oh, no, please. Thank you, Camina. I want to touch. I mean, community en engagement or empowerment, is, as you've as you've spoken about, has been something that's come up. And obviously, the the means through which communities organise themselves. From your own perspective, working with voluntary organisations, um, what what evidence are you seeing of of community uh, involvement and participation uh, out there? Is there, a, is there the disparity that Professor Mitchell had identified earlier between uh, affluent and deprived communities in terms of people's participation and involvement, either through voluntary organisations or other means? This is, this is a very, it's, it's a very mixed picture which expresses the, uh, you know, so in, 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 as you say, in some more uh, deprived areas, you, you will get a, a good deal of community activity going on. But as, as Ruchi has pointed out, we, we very often find partly because of a tradition and partly because of the remoteness of authority that, that there is a lot of activity goes on in relatively sparsely populated rural areas. So it's very, I don't have the research that would give you a kind of a, a, a very clear answer on that. It's a, it's a very mixed picture. What I would say, though, is that... that um, there's a certain extent to which um, the relationship with public bodies, with the local government and so on, where that matters, where it can create a more enabling environment where you can get a bit more of a, a flourishing of, of third sector activity. And, and it takes that kind of, um, if you like, more permissive environment for, for that to happen. There are 45,000 voluntary organisations out there. I think we've estimated 1.2 million people volunteer with them. So there's a, there's a massive resource happening. And, then that, and certainly, if you're looking at that kind of scale, that's not all happening in some areas and just affluent areas. It's happening right across the board. And indeed, in, in some of the most uh, marginalised communities, you will see people within those communities taking the initiative, trying to inspire the people around them to, to change something and, and thereby bringing a lot of other people on board. And that happens everywhere. And I, and I think we, we need to move away from the idea that, you know, of, of this kind of thing about volunteering and uh, traditional volunteering and the middle class thing. So this, this is about voluntary action. It's about community life. It's community activity. And it's happening right across the board. Um, some, uh, not, not all of that is resourced by government. And not all of it needs to be resourced by government. And the key issue here, here I think, that I, I guess I, I keep coming back to because I think it's important, is this, is not, this should not just be about the funding relationship that local government has with these activities. It's also how local government organises itself in such a way that the environment within which all these 45,000 uh, activities happen is, is a flourishing one and it can encourage it to happen even more. I don't know if you've read the evidence that we took in the Western Isles, but one of the points that was being made there about volunteering was that in, in some areas, urban areas, for example, volunteering is something that you perhaps opt into doing. In places like the Western Isles, it's something that you have to do that, that, that is essential to, to ensure that the community functions. In terms of what you're saying there, you, know, you talk about 1.2 million people volunteering in, in various organisations. Um, how... How do you think that can be translated into people 
going from this, the, the sense of you know doing some voluntary work to being more involved in some of the other aspects of community and do you think that there, that that can help perhaps repair or 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 restore the link that exists between communities and and local government and those who who make decisions on behalf of communities do you think there's a role in that respect I think that's a very good question. I think my response to you would be that we need to be really careful that we don't try and seek to control and direct what people do when they want to become active. People will become active for various different reasons. Some people become active and it won't even be visible to any kind of volunteering survey, for example, carers or people that are supporting people in their own home. or uh, you, you won't always get that through numbers and figures. So I think it's important that we don't try and try and fit people into a certain kind of mold and say, right, because you're already active, therefore we can now get you to become more active in sitting around uh, committee tables or local area committees or whatever that might be in order to influence decisions. That might be something they've got absolutely no interest in whatsoever. Uh, a lot of activity takes place despite what government wants, not because of what government wants. And I think that's the beauty of being in a healthy, vibrant democracy. And I think, so again, I think it's about how government recognizes that there's things out there that's already working, and how can you improve the environment so that even more than that can happen. Yeah, the, the only thing I'd add to that is, is that that points again to the two types of participation that I was trying to kind of allude to in, in the beginning is there's, there's some participation uh, uh, in the, the democratic life of the community, which will not be about the kind of um, influencing decision making, but will be about getting involved in the third sector, volunteering and so on. Sometimes it will cross over, but some, sometimes it won't. It's just too... It is too diverse a topic to say that it, that it necessarily could. The only thing I'd say, though, is, is from, from my own experience of this, is, is where, where, where somebody has been, if you like, supported to be brought into that a little bit more, you, you pique an interest in, uh, in the ability to both do more and to influence things. Um, we've, we've kind of, I think in Scotland, slightly um, in some, some places, weakened the sense in which we would automatically do things beyond our day job. We've weakened that a little bit and sometimes a bit of support can help uh, bring people back into that kind of way of thinking that I could do more, I could help decide more things and, and be more involved in my community. Sometimes a little bit of support can help bring people along that road. Yeah, I wonder, very briefly, Mr. No, sure. I, I wonder as well then um, around you know, how people... Um, go from making that, that, that step of volunteering to, to becoming more active if they wish to do so, but also whether the balance is right between communities. Do you get the sense that uh, even from a voluntary, uh, a volunteering aspect that the areas of activity are not always areas of need? Absolutely. I think, I think you're right. I think Professor Mitchell, as I understand, alluded to some of this before. So you, 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 you might well have people more actively interested in their local politics or indeed in, in contributing to what the local authority wants to discuss or decide. And, and they may well be the people who've had experience of sitting around committee tables, of, of working in that kind of model. And, they, and so in those areas, you might see more activity than in other areas. So I, I would guarantee to you that in areas such as Govan and Shettleston, where the interest levels in, uh, part, in participating in some of the decisions that the local authority would be doing was quite low, and you know, evidenced by indeed some of the interest in, in, what, in, the, in the voting record there, you would have at the same time seen some excellent activity happening with, with uh, parent groups, uh, sports clubs, with uh, befriending, with lunch clubs, with uh, a whole range of community supports that people would have been very actively involved in, let alone food banks and, and the volunteering that's currently taking place in, in food banks. Um, but yeah, I, I, you know, I would agree that you know, in terms of the, the kind of engagement, I think one of the things I would just uh, raise in response to that is we've seen some excellent examples around the world, in, and which have been reflected in, in, in Scotland as well, around participative budgeting, where some genuine budgetary power is, is given to uh, people to decide, and you know, small, small amounts of money, but where they can actually make a decision. Now, uh, in one of the examples we submitted to the committee, uh, looking at Porto Alegre in Brazil, uh, it, that constituted up to 9 to 10% of the local authority's budget. Yet here, I think it's, ve it's very difficult to get uh, you know, even small scraps to be invested in that kind of activity, even though we've seen at least a few examples now in Scotland. 
yes, absolutely. I just pick up on that on that participatory budgeting point because it's it's a perfect example. And although although it's smaller amounts of money, it partly comes to um, Mark McDonald's point about um, where people might move from volunteering into being more in, engaged and making dis influencing decisions, if you like, having a view. Um, some th there was participatory budgeting undertaken by um, Edinburgh Voluntary Organisations Council, which is part of the TSI in Edinburgh, and and that was with was with older people. Now now that's volunteers, that's people within in the local community. Why, why did they take part? Because they were able to see that they would influence something which would have an outcome. Something would change as a result of them moving from volunteering to actually bothering to give a view to take part in those processes. And that's the, that's the secret, whether it's volunteers or the wider community. If you think it's going to be worthwhile and it's going to have an influence, it might be worth uh, taking part. I think the difficulty I have with, with this discussion is, is, is the broadness of the range. When you talk about the third sector, um, the voluntary sector, um, we're talking from local <laughs> sports teams up to large providers of services um, and in terms of looking at, 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 at the issues that, that, that confront us in terms of the future direction of local government as well, where that all fits together. Um, and I suppose I would want to home in on community planning and how community planning can, can, can be used to try and tackle some of that. Because I've, I've noticed over the last number of years something that you were talking about there about um, contracts and, 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 and being able to procure services. I've noticed in, in, in my own area and the county Mead constituency across Fife, you have local um, voluntary organisations that have been developed over a number of years coming out of exactly those local communities that you're talking about where there's been need identified and providing certain services and suddenly a contract goes out for those services, along comes a large third sector organisation with people that are able to write the tender documents, etc., and they sweep up the contracts. And those local organisations that had a local committee, a local board, are, are basically defunct. And, and it just seems there's a bit of a contradiction there. But, but you know, we, don't, we, we do live in a world where there is contradictions and local authorities are under immense um, difficulty. So it's how, it's how the third sector, even the third sector interface organisations operate there. And if you take the opposite side of that, the evidence that we talked about other, earlier with Professor Mitchell, where, where we talked about these local area committees and local community planning at that level, and take they've got an outcome there, for example, that says improve health and well-being in that local community. If you take my own constituency, there are hundreds of volunteers that are engaged in thousands of kids every week in sport. You've got the Cubs movement, the Scouts movement, you've got all those different uniformed organisations and whatever, and that will be engaging much more young people than the council through its youth services will. Um, but it's how that's organised, how do we get the money to finance that, and how do they actually get a say? And it just seems to me there's something there about community planning and recognising the different levels, a bit like the, you know, the, the third sector. It's, it's massive when you talk about it in those senses, so you've got to almost start to, to break it down and get it to community level, going up to the strategic decisions. Okay, Mr. Shah. Sorry, I, what was the question on that? I, I, well, how, how, do, how do you, how, 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 even the third sector interchange, it's, you're along here representing the third sector and the voluntary sector, but you know, it's, it's that wide. In that massive, and indeed, I a think lot what Mr. Rowley is trying to get to is um, the difficulties that there offer, often is with voluntary sector and third sector organisations competing with one another uh, for the budgets, which often leads to the demise of some of the smaller um, units. It's not just that, Chairman. It's how do you, convener? It's it's how how it's how what levels do people engage? And how do they engage? And what is the role of community planning in that process? And what's the third sector's role in in, in that community planning? OK, I mean, I, I can reflect on the, the diversity of the sector part of that. Um, I think people engage at different levels at the same time. So people will be involved in their local activities, their sports clubs or whatever, at the same time as they might be involved in larger organisations, maybe as a trustee of a, of a group, or they might be an employee of one of the larger charities. At the same, and all of this could happen simultaneously, and it happens quite a lot. Um, 
And I think people feed into uh, planning processes, community planning processes at different levels. And, and indeed, they, it's, it's quite, and Callum will, will explain how we've currently uh, made an agreement with government, how we organize ourselves in terms of uh, engaging with community planning. But I think, broadly speaking, I think we would say that um, the diversity of the sector is a, is a strength at the same time. The issue, the particular issue which was raised, which is slightly difficult for us, is around competitive tendering for people services. And we have argued very strongly that that whole model is broken and we need to move away from that particular model. And changes in European uh, structural funding and European procurement rules, directives that have come out recently, I think have started to make available opportunities for thinking differently about how you procure services, particularly services for people, which I hope um, uh, governments uh, at different levels in Scotland um, and indeed at the UK level will, will all start to uh, take into account and, and start to change the way in which we procure those services. And that, in effect, will then reduce some of the fighting against each other that you can sometimes see between charities uh, within, within our sector, let alone between sectors, which is really kind of uh, creating a lot of problems for our sector and the people we serve. Mr. Irvin? Uh, yes, I mean you've um, you've you, you've gone straight to a very challenging part of the third sector interface rule, which is is in in the grant agreement it says um, build a third sector relationship with community planning. Now, um, I, I don't think anybody has fully uh, explored what that means yet, because it's a hugely challenging thing to do. The third sector, as you say, is is massively diverse. It will from time to time compete with each other, so it's a very difficult thing to do. Um, we, we, we've talked about it with TSIs and with other people in the third sector and pointed out that that role in community planning is twofold in effect, which is contribute is, is less about representation, more about contributing the views of the third sector, but also about talk trying to encourage other community planning partners to look at what assets there are in the third sector that could be supported to brought to some of the challenges for the community that they're meant to be planning for. But one of the problems with community planning is that um, things are still, although it says community planning, things are still in quite a rigidly linear fashion in community planning. So where would the, um, and this, of course the third sector isn't always designed like that. So as you say, that other community activity that's out there, if you, if you plan things in a very linear topic-based fa uh, uh, fashion, how would you be able to uh, um, lend some support, some resource to other aspects of the third sector that might, um, if you like, have a preventative effect but don't think of themselves as applying themselves to, whether it's social care, community transport or, what, or whatever it is? Um, you, might not, you, might be a, um, a, you might be a community organisation that doesn't fit with that topic over there, but um, but you actually could have quite a big impact on that. I'll come back to reshaping... Apologies for coming back to reshaping care again, but it does show up in that, whereby um, a community organisation is actually helping with uh, older people's outcomes, even though it had not thought it had anything uh, uh, to do with that. The TSI is trying to help people to translate all of that noise and information in the community planning table to say, well, there are these other people over here who could help with this. One of the examples that TSIs often use is, is bringing youth volunteering into some of these, these other challenges out there. Um, so there is a problem with a structures and the way that we do community planning, the lack of resource sharing, the lack of looking genuinely across linear boundaries. But then also, as Richier has pointed out, um, the, if we do things in a very procured fashion on a very large scale, then w w we're going to continue to struggle to bring the groups that you're pointing out that might miss out from support locally to bring them into, into the equation. So I'm not sure how, how clear that is, but Briefly, it's a big Riley. topic. <laughs> you said, go back to that, that, that point I made about mm. the hundreds of volunteers that are, that are engaged in the thousands of kids every week. You see it on the football pitches, you see it everywhere else. That happens despite what the council does, it happens with the greatest respect, despite what the interface or, or, or CV or whatever are doing, that's happening anyway. And part of the, the, the challenge, I think, is how do you actually enhance that? How do you support that and support that to develop and build even further into many sectors at a community level? Because that's people that's doing it themselves. Sometimes I think 
you know, we politicians and others think that we've got to do it for people. People actually lead the way and we have a bit of support and that's often what they'll say, these community groups will be saying, how could we get a bit more support? And they are meeting, if you, if you, if you go through a whole set of community plan outcomes that are set and community plans um, that are set by other partners, they're actually achieving more than, than the massive million pounds of resources that the Council's thrown at these, these outcomes. Never ask a politician to be brief. <laughs> um, can I maybe throw into the mix again, is it because we're looking at people um, as uh, consumers rather than producers? Um, as your report said, Mr Shah. Yes, I think you're absolutely right, that convener, you know, that in, in terms of looking at people as consumers. They, um, I think what, what's clear to me is that uh, there, are, there are some practical things that we could encourage um, government to do at a local level. One is to invest in community capacity, invest in the kinds of uh, supports that are available for these groups to thrive. So, for example, meeting places, meeting spaces, uh, fields, uh, you know, physical infrastructure that organisations can come and use and be around. That, that can help support this kind of activity to thrive. Um, local, local authorities can also you know, use their planning functions to make the environment within which this activity needs to latch on, hold on, um, um, more easy to to, to uh, organize itself around. And I think finally also, you know, let's see a return to more small grant schemes. You know, there's been a trend over the last uh, decade or so of shifting away funding from smaller grant schemes into the more formalized, larger contracts. And that's the wrong direction. Let's shift it back. Very Yes, uh, I mean, all I would add to that is is that um, I, I absolutely agree. I'd like to see more support for uh, for the kind of very organic community-based voluntary activity, smaller social enterprises supported to develop and so on. Um, and, and again, that, that, that's quite simply an extent of scale in finance. Um, the TS, I've given you one role of the TSI, the community uh, planning bit, but the traditional ones that they've been associated with for some time before somebody invented the term TSI, um, supporting volunteering, supporting social enterprise and, and supporting uh, voluntary organisations. That, that, that's vitally important. It's probably more important now than it's ever been. And I would strongly encourage um, politicians to continue to support that and consider supporting it more. Okay, thank you. We're really running out of time now, so briefly, Stuart McMillan. Uh, thank you, Convener. Good afternoon, uh, panel. Uh, I pose the question to panel, the first panellist, uh, and that was the, the issue of uh, kind of the number of local authorities. Uh, if, uh, if Scotland were to have more uh, but smaller local authorities, uh, how, would you, uh, how do you see uh, kind of the benchmarking actually taking place? Uh, between them, uh, and also uh, in terms of uh, if you have more smaller authorities, um, how do you think their approach to uh, actually kind of like a wider horizon um, view would actually take place? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not sure what you mean by ben benchmarking. Yeah. Uh, well, com comparing, comparing services. I think in terms of, uh, you're probably not aware of this, but we've been looking at um, comparing services between other local authorities, which um, if, if you're not really up to speed with that, I think it's not a question for, for yourself. It may be a difficult one for you. I, 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 <laughs> my apologies, it probably is quite cost. a difficult one, yeah. Mr Shah, have you got any comment on that? I've got one comment on that, uh, um, you know, in terms of, I'm not, not specifically on the benchmarking, but the, the rest of what you said. Uh, I think we're quite clear, although we're, we're still having a discussion uh, with our sector on this, about that local government needs to operate the most appropriate scale to maximise public engagement in the policies that affect the communities they serve. And, you know, a lot of people have referred to the fact that uh, Scotland, in terms of ratio of uh, local authority councillors or local authorities to uh, the population, is quite a large ratio compared to many other countries, and that creates a little bit of a barrier. Uh, so certainly we would, we would uh, you know, encourage that. But at the same time, you know, we're, we're very aware that uh, uh, you know, any kind of reorganisation is very costly. In, in, in fact, the third sector's own resources from local government took a dive in the mid-90s when we saw the last local government reorganisation. And as a result, it's, uh, it's, it's other, it, it had to diversify the way it raised its resources in other ways. So you know, it, it's a difficult one, but we'll be, engage, we'll be engaging in a debate with our own members on this. Thank you. Um, is there a, uh, well, on the, the, the Mr Escamar report, um, is there enough uh, transparency and openness uh, in the way that local government currently 
uh, decides uh, what it's actually doing and also with the, with the, the discussions that we'll have with the third sector. Um, I'd, I, I think sadly not. Um, and I think, I think the problem's twofold. Um, I'll go back to a point I made earlier on that I think comes out in Oliver Escobar's report, which is there's, there's still this sort of, even where the relationship is very good in TSIs, other third sector organisations have worked very hard to build good relationships and get activity going. Um, there's still a slight parity of esteem thing whereby, um, you know, around that community planning table, for example, um, there's some things that I'm willing to share, but I'm not going to share the totality of decision-making that needs to be made. In other words, preformed decisions arrive at the table. But the second aspect, I think, is really important, and I think, um, I think it was Maureen Monroe from Western Isles was trying to bring this out a little bit, which is, which is very common to CSIs, is it, it's very hard when you've got the mass of information and complexity of data coming from a suite of very large public bodies, how a small TSI, or, or even worse, the third sector beyond the TSI, how could they interrogate that data meaningfully such that the, um, the rest of the third sector could understand that, understand how to influence it, and understand how they could bring, you know, they could get involved in that activity that that's pointing to information as power. And I think there is, um, what that points to is an issue there about how, how much do you want to, if you like, level up the relative power of the third sector in those relationships? How strong do you want the third sector to be to be able to interrogate that complexity of data and information when the public bodies, because they need it, um, have got um, a variety of staff resource able to come up with that data and interrogate it themselves? There's just nothing like that scale in the third sector. It's a very difficult thing to do to be able to, to get into that. Sir Shah, please. I, I don't think I have anything to add to okay. what Callum has said on that. Um, John Wilson, please. Thank you, Convener. Good afternoon. I start by saying I'm a chair of a local community organisation that's working hard in the local community to de deliver services. But one of the issues that they often raise is the issue about the preferred conduit for local government funding or funding. Uh, and sometimes you've made reference, uh, Mr. Irvin, to the reshaping care. Now, the local authority in North Lanarkshire decided that the, the money funding for reshaping care would come through a particular organisation. Local communities would then bid for that money. Uh, and it's often been said that the, the local communities don't feel they're getting the share of that resource that they should be entitled to, that the resources seem to be going elsewhere. And that applies to food co-ops, community transport, and various other aspects where even within the sector, communities feel that they're actually being shortchanged by the organisations that are actually administering the money on behalf of the local authorities. Have you monitored that? And would you be willing to make suggestions, as both as SCVO or as uh, no Voluntary Action Scotland, how good practice should be carried through in that instance? Mr. Shah, well, indeed, in North Lanarkshire, we also saw uh, in recent years a public social partnership model that was d uh, used around recycling furniture, and, and a whole pipeline built around that involved a lot of different types of organisations, different sizes and scales, to, to contribute in their particular expertise. And I think that kind of model, which speaks to a collaborative ethos, sits very well with the, the way in which the third sector likes to operate, which, it sees as, which reflects its own values. Indeed, at SCVO, we've been running a consortia model uh, for the past few years, starting with the Future Jobs Fund around employability and then moving into Community Jobs Scotland, which has been a very successful model, not least because it brings organisations together rather than in competition with each, with each other. And so I think for us, the, the key here is how do you build more collaborative approaches to public services? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think one of the, um, the, the guards against that is um, a role that I've noted with where it's worked well with TSIs and where it's been supported is a sort of bro brokerage role where if the TSI can act as a kind of neutral broker and is supported to engage a wider community in third sector, that you've got more opportunity for other parts of that community in third sector to come to the table and access those funds and, and, and provide um, services. What I would say is, is in terms of in terms of data, we're hoping to well, we are going to be developing um, 
more work at looking at looking at how does that work? Because it'll be a huge diversity of how it works. Some places it will happen, some some it won't happen. It's a relatively new thing that isn't supported in every area. But we'd want to look to look at what how the TSI role can be best brought to, to that challenge, i.e. widening the opportunity for the third sector. How do they engage the third sector? As happily as we learn information, I'll obviously bring that back, back to the committee. But one of the concerns I have is that many local authorities may decide to divest themselves of the decision-making process when it comes to local community organisations and just give the, the funding to a TSI and say, there you are, you get on with it, you div it up. We're not going, to, uh, not going to get involved in that local debate about how that money is divided. Uh, and it's really trying to, if we're talking about local democracy, then what have we, or what have you done to ensure that local democracy exists within those structures, to ensure that community organisations across the board, whether that be you know, made up of volunteers or made up of you know, some, and we have some very good professional voluntary organisations, how do you ensure that those different interests can come together to ensure that what's being decided is a decision that is made on equal terms across the sector? Mr. Shah, please. You know, clearly we've spoken a lot about co-production and uh, you know sh shared decision making and shared outcomes. I think uh, what what you can't do is is basically just replicate the same model that might you might have been, you might be seeing with the the authority that's giving you the the resource. Now, we we recently uh, ran a, a grant scheme. Uh, jointly with the community transport sector on behalf of the Scottish Government, uh, which is, is currently ongoing, actually. And, and through that particular scheme, it's about upgrading community transport buses. Now, clearly, that's a, an, uh, that's, that's a system which involves um, uh, community transport providers bidding in for some resource. And so, you know, we, we clearly face those kind of issues there. And, and it, it's, it's imperative that we ensure that we Bring, build a grants panel that fully reflects the diversity of uh, input, expertise and interests in that. But of course you can't get away from the situation, not everybody's going to benefit from these schemes and there'll always be somebody who feels left out. And that's the nature of any kind of grant scheme really. Yeah, ab absolutely. I mean that's, um, even where you fully engage and involve the third sector, some, some people are going to be feel that they didn't get their, their part in that the, the finances are limited but if 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 you're if you're picking up on a, a particular example you want to pick up on away from here I'm happy to happy to talk about it, it sounds as though you might be and I'd be happy to to, to pick that up obvious, obviously obviously it's expressing concerns have been raised with me about particularly I think Mr Shah made the community transport issue and the allocation of uh, minibuses that were made through particular areas and it was a, an issue that came up from a community group that said they felt they were uh, not fully considered and that's part of the problem was giving the confidence to communities if they're going to participate in that process that there is a transparent decision making process in place similar to what we're calling for in terms of local accountability for local authorities the voluntary sector have to understand they have to also be accountable when making those types of decisions well, I fully agree with that sentiment, Ab absolutely. Um, I'm going to uh, finish off with what may seem like a, a bit of a flippant question, um, and that's round about some of the language um, that we use. Um, and I know we're in front of a Scottish Parliament committee today, but we see terminology changing all of the time. And in terms of truly engaging uh, communities and trying to empower folk, uh, I think we probably need to think a little bit more right across the board of the language that we use. If we look at some of the new ones, co-production is the, the word of the minute, basically. Um, community anchor, uh, anchor organisations, third sector interfaces, they we, we then uh, chuck that down and use the acronyms. Um, it is extremely confusing for people and uh, a, a bit of a turn-off. And I hope that you guys as organisations um, can actually put us right when we add to that uh, uh, verbiage uh, and that you do likewise. Um, I just wonder if you've got any comment on that very briefly. The, the, the TSIs have often described a big part of their role as actually being a translator. 
because that applies to the wider community. How would they know what all these words mean? But also, as, as we've been talking about earlier on, if you're in the smaller end of the third sector, the community sector, why on earth would you know what all this terminology means? So they spend a lot of their time trying to translate that verbiage for, for the community sector. Uh, Absolutely. I totally agree with you. I think we need to have, you know, I mean, certainly in, when, when it comes to SCVO in terms of our public briefings, you know, we don't use these kind of words and language. We, we, we don't even use the word third sector sometimes. Um, so, you know, but I guess when we're in front of a committee like yourselves or speaking with government officials, other, we, we tend to fall back on shorthands just to save time. In terms of SV, SCVO, to be fair to you, uh, in terms of your community documents, uh, it, uh, it tends to be okay. But uh, I've seen some other organisations who continue to use that language, which is extremely confusing. Can I thank you very much for your time today, gentlemen? Um, and I suspend and we move immediately into private session. Thank you.